Creating satirical storytelling based on a video game does not mean you can write anything and be praised for it. We are not doing the Space Wizards thing on this channel, okay? Even he ended up regretting saying that. The point being, the deft hand in which you can weave substantive allegory, caricature, and poignant explorations of insane patterns or mundane cruelty in life is something we should ask nothing but the best for. Satire can be one of the most powerful instruments to affect change in one's mind, or one of the most embarrassing ways to reveal your own naive perspective. Now, I'm not a man who demands realism for all these stories, nor cartoonish craziness for all of them either. I demand internal consistency. All that matters is what the story tells me matters. Regardless of all that, let's have a chat about the new Fallout show. Bud has an idea for three interconnected vaults. Bud's Buds, because the basic obstacle to achievement has been the brevity of the human lifespan. It's prevented us from working on projects that take us entire millenniums into the future. Buds Buds will solve that. So, we have Vault 31 releases junior executives periodically when they've been unfrozen to become overseers in Vaults 32 and 33. Through many generations, the plan is to end up having a society of super managers. Because the junior executives have been taught how to be managers and they're going to teach everyone else how to be managers. Everyone's going to be managers. It's going to be amazing. People who are good at management will create the best society. That's what Buds Buds is all about. Once everyone on the surface is dead, the super managers will emerge and create a great society. Until then, Vaults 32 and 33 will exchange people periodically to ensure population growth. Which means what? Vault 32 and 33 are just people to be controlled? To be bred? To create super managers? Well, Vault 33 is okay, but 32 is filled with people strangling each other. Oh gosh, they're, they're all dying. There's blood on the walls. Jesus. But 32 was not overpopulated, not like the rat utopia experiments playing on the video inside the vault. Instead, they discovered the truth and went mad. They killed themselves and each other, and they tried to get into Vault 31. But how did Vault 32 discover the truth? And why would discovering the truth that instead of a vault in which you're meant to be kept safe and secure, you are being trained to become a super manager that will take over civilization at some point? Why, why is that? Like, why? Why, why would that be the thing that makes you want to kill yourself? Like, yes, you've been lied to, but ultimately you're still in the exact same situation, only now you know that you're meant to take over. Like, this is a vault tech personal project. They're, they're guinea pigs, sure, but they're very well kept guinea pigs. However, if we pop our thinking caps on, perhaps Bud decided that the crop of super managers in 32 was so much less effective than those in 33 that he culled them. He forced all their food sources to die out, hoping to then, as we see in the show, split 33, the good crop, into halves and repopulate 32. But that doesn't really explain why they killed each other or themselves, nor why they wouldn't have asked for help from 33 during all of this hardship. We see how easy it is to get into an overseer's account. How come they didn't try to open the Vault 33 door out of desperation when they were willing to try it with 31? If they know, then they should know there's only cryotubes in there. 33 has food and water and people who are willing to help. But ultimately, why wouldn't they open their front vault door to the wasteland when we know they are perfectly capable of doing so since Moldava does it two years later from the outside and Lucy does it in her own vault. Hell, we find out Rose did it without Bud or Hank's permission with Hank to follow her. Bud is apparently incapable of stopping any of that. And so you want me to buy that not a single person in Vault 32 was willing to brave the outside instead of starving to death? They must have had very specific and strange knowledge to make all of this fit, but I still really don't know how. What did you know, motherfuckers? Did you find out that Vault Tech blew up the world? Because, I mean, I don't see how they could possibly have found that out, but I also don't know why that would make them kill themselves. You know, however they found out, they don't even have proof. They never got Vault 31 open. How do they know what happened? And you know what? If they have an equal exchange rate of people from Vaults 31, 32, and 33, then why wouldn't they have questioned when they have referenced the fact that they know people come from Vault 31 that no one goes to Vault 31? This all becomes super retarded when you take into consideration that they start up a saying for voting in Vault 31 as for the best results. Doesn't that highlight this very strange coincidence? As if they want to make it further suspicious, they apparently tell all of the super managers from 31 to talk about how good the fucking potatoes are. How are you gonna tell me anyone believes this shit? How are you gonna tell me that there are any stakes in the investigation? The bag of tricks from comedy can be useful. <laughs> you know, where instead of having people be awesome, why not have them be dumb? If the answer to this is everyone's retarded, then why isn't Lucy's brother retarded? And if they are sending people to Vault 31, 
one and they just get dealt with, who's dealing with them? The fucking brain bot? He's not doing shit. So even if people were periodically sent to Vault 31, Bud Brain ain't killing them, so I, I, I don't understand. How did people not figure out something weird was going on? Why did it take Grimby? He's Grimby, don't fight this. So Moldava wants to take her raiders into Vault 33 via Vault 32 with the Pip-Boy from Rose. Considering their wacky approach, why didn't they just go straight into 33? They were willing to raid Vault 32, so why not just raid Vault 33? And then how insanely lucky is it that everyone's already killed each other ages ago in Vault 32, meaning they have every opportunity to simply take over and pretend to be Vault 32. But then why was everything untouched and unlived in in Vault 32 since the deaths of the Vault Dwellers? Remember, the raiders arrived and had to live there until the date for the wedding that was organized by Moldava over the Overseer's Terminal with Hank. I have no idea how she was able to pass any kind of basic check from him, by the way. We see them fully kitted out with Vault suits, Pip Boys, exchange of information, and fundamental knowledge of the situation regarding the Vaults. They even understand etiquette, somewhat. Meaning the Raiders lived in Vault 32 and changed nothing? They just hung out with the corpses right next to them as they conducted everyday life? No attempt to maybe move the bodies? Were they lucky enough to arrive just a day before the triennial schedule and Hank agreed despite having no contact for two years? Once you reach the end of the season, the notion that Hank would be overprotective of Lucy is an understatement. You'd think someone like him would discover as much as he could about the man marrying his daughter. You know, hopefully as a baseline you confirm he's not a fucking psychopath. I guess a man who chooses to nuke an entire city out of spite for his wife taking his daughter away doesn't care too much about who she marries. I also think it's strange that a pit boy for Vault 33 can open the front vault door for Vault 32 when they are very deliberately separated vaults designed for seclusion as part of the experiment. In fact, I'm surprised that everyone has the potential to access each other's vaults. We've seen the denial of access in some cases, but why would someone outside of Vault 32 with a 33 Pip-Boy be granted access? Why wouldn't Bud have controls to prevent the opening of all three vaults? Surely the release of any super managers is the final plan, and so surely it must be approved by him. But okay. So her plan has now evolved into pretending to be Vault 32 people, to then perform a faux wedding with the Vault 33 people, to then capture Hank McLean and take him back to the observatory because he has the codes to activate the cold fusion. What a wonderful plan! Except everyone's a retard. Why didn't Vault 33 do any systemic or rad checks with Vault 32, nor did they recognize any of these people despite making trades once per three years? What, did everyone die and get replaced with people who had a three-year growth spurt? How the fuck does any of this happen? Wouldn't Hank have known about a replacement overseer while in communication with Bud and the mysterious silence from Vault 32 for two years? Do you guys remember when they split Vault 33 into two halves so that they can do this same system forever? Do you really think it would make a lick of sense to them to not recognize anyone after just three years? Is everyone stupid? None of you were capable of lifting your arm up one time to check for radiation? And then on the Raiders side of the retardation, they just let anyone casually walk into Vault 32 to see all of the dead people. Why the fuck would you let anyone in to see the dead people? That literally ruins the whole fucking point. All the raiders had to do was say, ah, oh, fuck, you know what? No one's allowed in because we had a cold spread around and there's a bunch of people in there with a cold and you can't come in. But that never should have fucking worked because everybody would recognize these aren't Vault 32ers anyway. The goal of the raiders was to infiltrate Vault 33 and get access to the Overseer because he has the codes they need. But if you rewatch that episode, they don't secure him whatsoever. They could have walked him away to a one-on-one -on -one conversation and knocked him out, but instead they send people in to randomly kill. They are just blim blamming, they're eating, they're shouting, setting things on fire, blowing things up. Oh look, a pregnant lady with a fork in her eye is shooting everyone. The overseer wasn't even captured. They don't make him a priority, they instead wait for him at the entrance and hope. What if he had been killed? That would have fucked up the whole plan. When he arrives with his daughter, they don't kidnap them both and then use her as leverage for him to activate the cold fusion or anything like that. Instead, they say, choose your daughter or these people. And he chooses his daughter. And so the people run away. Wait, they run away? They're supposed to die. Then the bad guys leave with him and not her. Apparently, they don't want to liberate anyone from the vault, the people who have been lied to their whole lives. Some of these people are the same people the beloved Rose tried to save. The worst of it is that Moldava allows her cretins to have the run of the place, and they almost kill Lucy several times. Is this not one of Rose's two 
children, you fucking idiot? What the fuck were you thinking? Are you honoring Rose and her goals by casually killing the children she tried to save when they had no idea what was happening? Why didn't you go in there, capture and restrain one by one until you can save them all from this experiment? Why were you happy for all of these people to suffer and die? Why, little Miss Power to the People, were you happy to unleash your raiders into a world filled with ignorant slaves to an experiment, watching everyone get sliced, diced, and decked, including some really barbaric bullshit? Why? Why was this your plan? Why? It doesn't make any fucking sense at all. Why did you leave so many of your own people in the vault? How is it even possible that your armed, armored, and ambushing raiders even lost? It makes no fucking sense. You could have taken over the vault. You could have gotten everyone out. You could have taken advantage of all the resources. What is wrong with you? I, this is going to be a very unstructured rant where I just talk about how much this show is terrible. Since we're near the subject, why don't we talk about Moldava, the woman who leads the NCR, who wants to get justice for Rose and wants to provide free, clean energy to the people of the wasteland. Her plan was to go from the observatory to Vault 32 to Vault 33 back to the observatory. This mission would involve collecting Hank McLean. She needs Hank McLean because he has the code that will activate cold fusion. However, she also needs what Wilzig puts into his neck. So Moldava organizes a very long system of retrieval for Mr. Wilzig. She provides Rufus with caps, who then provides Tommy with caps, who then provides Ma June with caps, who then agrees to provide protection and escort to Wilzig to the observatory. Now you may have one question there. Why the fuck didn't Moldava just pick up Wilzig herself? She and her team of raiders went to Vault 32 on foot. That's where Lucy starts. She, by chance, bumps into him in Philly and then takes his head to the observatory. The only reason an extended set of idiots would have been paid caps by her to move him from Philly is because she knew he would be in Philly. Had she just waited with her raiders in or near Philly for a day, she could have taken him with her. But no, instead of handling it herself like she did with Hank, she's gonna pay Rufus to pay Tommy to pay Ma June to get him there. Is she stupid? We're supposed to believe Moldava loves Rose. She says, oh, you know, Lucy, your mother was so kind, so loving, so curious, so clever. She says these attributes were quite reflected in Lucy. If that's true, then why the fuck didn't you care what happened to Lucy in Vault 33? Your raiders almost killed her several times. Uh, did you want your best friend's daughter to be tricked into sleeping with some random raider as well? The fuck? Second, why didn't you liberate her from Vault 33 as well as her brother? Third, why didn't you save the people there in general? Fourth, why didn't you prevent Rose from going feral? Did you not provide her the vials to stop her skin from melting? And then, of course, if you care about her so much, why the fuck are you letting her live like this? She's half skeleton. Why the fuck are you letting this happen? Oh, she was so kind and loving and curious and clever, and I hold her hand at the end because, oh, we achieved our goal. Oh. Fucking hell, you could have put her out of her misery. Fifth, why did you want to blow up a bunch of innocent people with that bomb? You psycho cunt. She literally provides a personal threat to a pregnant woman. How is this in character? Sixth, why did she introduce herself as... Lee Moldava? You'd have to very shakily assume Hank never saw of or heard of Moldava, despite his company having bought out hers pre-war. And then she would need to hope that he never saw her or learned about her in the wasteland when he went to get his kids and destroyed Shady Sands. On that note, how does Moldava even know Hank blew up Shady Sands? It could have been all kinds of people outside of a single vault dweller. Did he say he did it? Cause like, why the fuck would he do that? And of course, if he did tell her he did it, then he would know her. In fact, this gets even weirder because she almost expects him to know her. I think I know who you are. Everyone knows who I am. On one hand, this could literally be anyone looking for revenge for what Hank did to Shady Sands rather than Moldava. But on the other, if it's an obvious choice to think she is THE Lee Moldava, why did you give your fucking name when introducing yourself in an attempt to trick him? Lee Moldava? And then there's the stupidity. She was willing to raid 33 and 32, but didn't want to start with 33 for some reason, making her entire goal much harder. And don't forget, she ditched her own people after sending them to attack and kill more 
innocent people. Why did she feel the need to blow up the connecting vault door for 32 and 33, but not the entrance to 33? If she's trying to prevent them from chasing her, she would need to block both doors. Also, super lucky there wasn't way more extreme security on the armory, eh? And to put a pin in that, on one hand, she was apparently unable to recreate the technology that she herself spearheaded 200 years ago in order to have versions that don't rely on vault tech control. I guess she didn't hold back any technology, blueprints, or intelligence from vault tech when they bought her out despite her hating them. But on the other hand, she was able to create the equipment required to facilitate cold fusion as a source of power for an entire electricity grid? You understand California got nuked several times, right? Did you reinstall and repair the power stations, transformers, substations, and pylons? You then network it all back to the Griffith fucking observatory? How? Why? The show would have you convinced that Lee Moldava is a survivor, carved out and forced into harsh conditions by the cruelty of Vault Tech, when in actuality she is a completely retarded collection of random actions dependent on what imagery they want to create at the time of filming. Also, how the fuck has she been alive for 200 years? In any case, Moldava dies the hero of the show. Apparently, despite all of the horrors she's committed, we're supposed to think she's a good guy, but let's be honest, Moldava is dumb as fuck and an evil son of a bitch, which just so happens to be absolutely against every last piece of spoken and described characterization the show wants to provide her, and she's not the only character to be assassinated. It's so obviously monstrous that you kept Rose as a fucking pet ghoul, you witch. Anyway, let's talk about Hank McLean, the noble leader who will do anything to save his daughter. She is his world. Nope, he wants to ensure her safety because she's the future of the super manager gene pool. We discover he will destroy all non-super managers, meaning literally everyone else. Apparently he fully agrees with Bud and he must ensure the future of super managers because I guess that's the only society that will work is super managers? I guess he didn't foresee the idea of some people having different thoughts. His wife left the vault with his children and so he decided to kill her. When he knew she was in Shady Sands, he somehow managed to get in there, kidnap his children back, and then nuke the place and kill everyone. How did any of that happen? I don't know. All they say is he burned the city to the ground. He burned that city to the ground. Because that's how Vault Tech deal with competition. That's how Vault Tech deals with competition. You know, he's just a mustache twirling villain. He doesn't want people to have energy and to live outside of the people in the vault. He doesn't want anyone alive outside of the vault. That's his character. He's a radioactive retard. Did he and the team really not anticipate meeting anyone outside of their own vaults? Only if they did, they would immediately nuke them. This is especially brain dead when he knew better than anyone there are over 100 vaults experimenting with the perfect human society. You are bound to encounter some non-supermanager factions with every layer you pick peel back, you can see more of the retarded molten core. Why did Hank suggest it would be Lucy's kids' generation that would be able to go to the surface and rebuild society? There are people up there who know what he did and hate him. He should be more than aware of the animosity toward him and Vault Tech. There's also plenty of factions Hank would be aware of. But, to be fair, the assumption right now is Hank will nuke everything to get rid of all of them. But wait, his grandkids can't go up there and the radiation levels would be reset and, uh... It just doesn't make any sense. And then there's the notion that he spent a week looking for Lucy and Grimby after having left Vault 33 through the main door. The story goes, Hank simulated a plague by quarantining everyone to their apartments for what I assume was a long bloody time if he managed to convince people he dropped to 128 pounds. Which raises the question of how the fuck did he pull that off? How did they simulate a plague right at the moment they needed it such that it was convincing to all of the people in the vault? Bud's experiment is super managers, not plagues. How do you effectively lie? to about 50 people about all of these variables when there's just about two people who can actually facilitate it. And then of course, why does Hank, a junior executive assistant, have not only the codes to activate cold fusion but the codes to launch a nuke on Shady Sands? Do they all have that kind of power? Seems pretty retarded to me. Fourthly and a half, Moldava isn't even phased by the fact that Lucy is the one delivering Wilzig's head to her. What she wanted from him and her relationship with him had absolutely nothing to do with Lucy, but she's like, oh, okay, that makes enough sense. She doesn't ask a single question as to how any of this fucking insanity happened. I had to make a choice between their violent world and our peaceful one. You see, Lucy, we needed a peaceful world, so I nuked everything. I know. 
I made the right choice. Oh, fuck. This is his faction speech, right? He says that when the world is factions, the only solution is to get rid of the factions. If the problem with the world is factions, then what is the solution but to get rid of the factions? If you do that, then there's only one faction left, and that's us, and we can shape the world. How does this line up when, by design, they are creating factions in vaults all over the world? Factions would be created by the mere separation of vaults 31, 32, and 33, Hank. You would develop smaller factions in your own fucking vault. But more importantly, what is your understanding of humanity, you stupid cunt? Humanity will always split into factions the more and more of them that there are. How do you not know this being an expert manager? Oh, and let's not even talk about how fucking lucky it is that a headless suit just falls into the room. You understand that if this didn't happen and if Lucy didn't become a retard and not point out the fact that he was putting it on, he would never have been able to escape. Ultimately, Hank McLean was introduced as a reasonable, intelligent, attentive, forthright, and caring man who wanted the best for his people and his family while maintaining focus under pressure. <sighs> that silo is reminding me of a much better show. If they wanted to go the direction of Hank being super evil and a diehard super manager, then why would Lucy giving him sad eyes be enough to convince him to betray vault -Tec? Like, why would he do something so antithetical to his belief system just because his daughter told him to when he believes she doesn't understand the situation? Especially when that code was probably all that was keeping him alive. It's his word against Moldavas. He can absolutely and easily argue she is lying. He can deny even having a code. I suppose it's lucky there wasn't a contingency code set up by vault -Tec that locks the entire system. My dad found out that I destroyed an entire community to save him. That'd break his heart. It's sad that Hank in episode 8 is a complete clown and this man was stolen from us. God, it's such a shame. Kyle McLaughlin deserves much better than playing a fucking cartoon. All right, let's talk about the Wilzig guy. Maybe I should have talked about him first, but this is unscripted, okay? We're doing crazy things here. Okay, so rogue enclave man, Wilzig. The enclave don't get a single explanation as to just what the fuck they even are, by the way. He is aligned with Moldava, and he hopes to steal enclave tech for the good of the wasteland. He does seemingly jeopardize this mission by trying to take care of a dog that would have been too small for standard intake. He doesn't create a solid place for the dog to be hidden or leashed when he absolutely could have. Like, like look at this. This is what he has, and he fucks this up. He also didn't lock his door, so some guy blunders in and sees his naughty plans and ruins everything. Like, seriously, if he had locked his fucking door, none of this would have happened. In any case, he then awkwardly survives a gun turret, unloading what looks to be about a thousand rounds at him while he shuffles away. How the fuck did this man escape the Enclave? How are you going to tell me that this old fuck waddled away from this facility when one person with a pistol could have stopped him. If all six agencies have the description of Rogue Enclave Man, why the fuck did he not lose the glasses, or change them if necessary, shave his head, wear anything different compared to his fucking bounty image, the retard? Like, he's spotted immediately by the first man familiar with the bounty. So he ends up with Lucy, and he does eventually give up. He got his leg shot off, and he's likely gonna bleed out, so he decides to take cyanide, and he tells Lucy to cut off his head. There's a couple issues issues with this. One of them being that he is very familiar with vault dwellers and specifically her vault. Not only that, he's directly aligned with Moldava. This means that the last person he would want what's in his neck to end up with would be someone like Hank McLean, the father of the person he is handing this to. You need to start acting like a surface dweller, Miss McLean. How do you know my name? You'd think Ma June, when offering a thousand caps to kill the ghoul, would be able to spare some change for a contact to escort Wilsey. At least someone more reliable for him than the daughter of the man who nuked Shady Sands, and by extension, I assume, the woman he works for? What even was the escort plan? Was she just gonna do it herself? Also, is he seriously dying in this scene because they forgot to give him a stim pack? They clearly had one. The fucking ghoul finds it on a desk where they were working on him. We're shown it stops bleeding, it's like a cure-all. Their pay is contingent on taking care of him. I see we only sometimes play by the game's rules, huh? 
Huh. Even stupider than that, however, is that he takes cyanide before explaining the situation. He does not ensure that she understands what is happening and what she has to do, and as a result, he dies during the explanation. Because of course, because that's writing. Thanks to that, Lucy doesn't know what the fuck is going on, but oh well, it's not like he was deathly invested in this mission being completed. It's not like it means freedom and power to the world. I'm sure he didn't really care that much. The grim reality of a character like Wilzig is that he isn't a character at all. He got pulled apart by the plot and the need for other characters to have journeys. By the end, he barely had any personal goals or motivations beyond being a quest giver to the main character. Pretty sad, since Michael Emerson is a very solid actor and he only got the one episode being a mangled doormat NPC. Anyway, that's him. Who else we got? Why don't we talk about Maximus, the best character? I'm sure all of you will agree. Everyone's favorite little shit. Whether the fucking razor blade in a boot thing was him or the friend, I don't I don't actually care at all. It was so fucking stupid. I, I, I wanted it to happen. Is that wrong? There's good in all people. There's good in all people. None of it makes any sense. No one should believe anyone could get wounded to that extent by stupidly shoving their leg into a razor bladed boot over and over again. Second, there's no way to think that it was actually him that did it. Like, there's no real evidence. But a bunch of people do assume that it was him and so he gets promoted? He denies doing it, of course, but expresses that he wants it to have happened. That is expressly antithetical to the creed of the Brotherhood of Steel in this show. I, I, I wanted it to happen. Is that wrong? Yes. It's also a blatant admission that he's awful for this job, on top of the fact that we find out the old fuckers think he probably did it anyway. And not that it matters, but why did Dane think this wouldn't affect anyone? Like, did you actually think you could butcher your own leg, deny responsibility, and no one would be blamed? And then, when that's actually brought up, the conflict of Maximus having taken the fall for Dane's self-harm, we get nothing. It's erased immediately. But who cares? Time for a promotion. Now he gets to be a squire. Like, why? Well, you see, it takes a lot to sabotage your fellow soldier and that's that's taken power or, or something he's like yeah sure whatever instead of having people be awesome why not have them be dumb so off he goes on his adventure and his knight gets bored and so lands for no other reason than fuck it and then they almost immediately bump into the exact trail of the guy they're following now bear in mind when sent on this mission the brotherhood are scouring the wasteland for Wilzig it just so happens that these guys drop out on their way to one location and they fall right on top of Wilzig's trail. Incredible. So then Maximus just lucks out because a Yao Guai decides to ninja attack the knight instead of him when he's not wearing any fucking armor at all. And so the knight is scared and he runs away in such a way that he fucking kills himself. <laughs> I don't know, he like breaks his neck or he's bleeded, it doesn't matter. It's just the ninja Yao Guai is so stupid. Anyway, the knight needs a stim to be alive, and because this show is written by shitty cartoon children, it, it doesn't actually like make anything make sense. He is desperate for a stim, and so he decides while his squire is collecting it to tell him how much he has failed and will be killed for it. It's written like shit, he's like, oh, you, why are you taking so long to get a stim? You're just so bad at your job, I can't wait for you to get me my stim so that you can then be killed for being bad at your job. You best get me that stim. Oh, oh. I'm gonna be bad if you don't get me that stim. I'm gonna die and then you'll you'll be in less trouble if you don't get me that stim. So Maximus lets the knight bleed out. And that's that. Why did he leave the squire bag behind? That thing is filled with all kinds of... Ugh. He gets contacted and supplied a replacement squire and tries to put on a voice to trick the Brotherhood as to who they're speaking to. This is Knight Titus. Over. That voice doesn't sound like anything, let alone Michael Rappaport. I'm okay. All good here. What the fuck are you trying to do? Anyway, the Brotherhood send him a replacement, and his reaction is to destroy his direct communication with them. This is despite explicitly claiming his path to redemption will be through getting the head to them, meaning he will need to maintain contact. Retard. The new squire doesn't have any confirmation checks, nor does he question why the comms are down for Titus. Literally one of those raiders could be in the suit right now, and he'd have no idea because the Brotherhood are inept. All right, now let's talk about this steel retard and his battle with the ghoul in which he gets his fucking foot stuck in the floor. How did a total moron such as yourself get past my defenses? Sorry, no idiot savants allowed. We like good conversation here. You can fly, motherfucker. You kicked a rock so hard it destroyed a building. You can absolutely step out from some wood. How does a man in power armor lose a fist fight to a fucking ghoul? This fight was horrible. It was embarrassing. Why not have them be dumb? 
All he had to do was crush the ghoul's head at any opportunity, but no, he kept throwing him around. So then he bumps into a bunch of fucking idiots trying to get into his armor, and he fights them? Like, he just decides, I'm gonna take you on 1v whole group for some reason. Obviously, he loses, but they don't kill him? How lucky. So he comes back, and the way they're gonna beat him this time is that they're gonna push him into his own armor so he can kill them. What the fuck are you doing? Jasmine, show our drooling friend the door, please. So he takes the identity of his knight, and he has sent a new squire, because of course his knight is dead and he was the squire. You get what it is. So he decides they need to get on the trail of the ghoul, because he's the one that will lead them likely to the head. They very cleverly point out they can follow the radiated trail of the ghoul. Always let us leave radiation trails, allowing the ghoul to live. You've made it possible to trace the whereabouts of the, of the target. You are in the radiated wasteland. You are surrounded by radiation. What do you mean you're gonna chase him through his radiated fucking trail? Oh, lovely. They've sent me a moron. They eventually get the head because this show is retarded. Maximus then feels he might just tell his squire that he's not actually a knight. The squire points out that the Brotherhood will probably kill him for this. And since Maximus has not yet learned how to lie, he fails miserably to explain himself. Fucking up so much that he decides it's probably best to simply kill his squire. Yes, this is real. This show is fucking real. He manages to crush his foot underneath the foot of a power armor the suit. This, however, does not subdue his squire, who in turn manages to unscrew and remove his fusion core. It is so fucking embarrassing. And if you weren't already convinced of that, Thaddeus, for some fucking reason, decided to not open the mask, execute Maximus with his pistol, pull out the body, and use the power armor for himself. This would certainly help the fact that he has trouble walking, it would help with his carry load, and it seems like he would be more than justified in doing so when Max killed his knife and tried to kill him, and he was gonna leave him for dead anyway. Which, I mean, you might want to finish the job in case he escapes. We also know that Thaddeus is absolutely motivated and willing to kill Max, as well as anyone who is standing next to him. <sighs> it's all so fucked up. You are either stupid or making fun of me. Either way, I will not waste my time. In any case, Maximus is about to be eaten by rad roaches. Everyone is happy about this. Finally, the plotline can end. Only luckily for him, Lucy happens to stumble into the scene and save his life. It is absolutely and entirely a coincidence because she just happened to be in the area. So Maximus and Lucy bump into fiends. The two fiends shoot at Maximus point blank. One of them misses, one of them shoots him in the shoulder while he, shooting after they have drawn, manages to kill them both. How lucky. He then clearly shows they have clothing he could need, knives he could need, but nope, he only takes the gun. How the fuck's this accurate to fall out? In any case, because he's too cool to heal, he's just gonna let his bullet wound bleed like a retard. Upon coming close to bleeding out, he happens to stumble across Vault 4 with Lucy. They heal them, supply them with antibiotics, and every single resource one could imagine needing. What crazy and insane luck to have stumbled across something like this when you're bleeding out. So old Maxipad decides to have a shower, eat some food, relax, watch some TV, everything is fine. Which is weird when he's been trained by the Brotherhood of Steel for the majority of his life and he's surrounded by mutants. You'd think he'd take issue, but he seems very happy. Only later he spots Lucy is captured. Instead of discovering any context, Maximus decides to go on a tard rage and save Lucy when she is clearly fucking fine. They try to imply he has to make the decision between his own comfort and Lucy's well-being. As though this is development for him when he knows so little about what's happening that he has no reason to assume he's not next. He's making the decision in this scene as though he's read the script and understands what the writers want him to think he's going through, rather than what a person would actually think in this scenario. It's so fucking bad. So upon exiting Vault 4, they decide to once again get back on the trail of the Squire. The Squire with the head. The Squire that was well ahead of them anyway. The Squire that was calling in the Brotherhood. They somehow catch back up to him. Imagine, they were just five minutes late. The whole show would be over. This is also where the squire realizes he's a ghoul because the wacky doctor who fixed his foot turned him into a ghoul, I guess. In any case, realizing he's a ghoul means that he can now not go back to the Brotherhood, which means he's more than happy to submit the head to these two. Do you understand just how astronomical all of these fucking coincidences are? Anyway, Max decides the head will go to Lucy so she can get her dad back and that Thaddeus can get away. 
away. He's just he's just not going to talk about what happened to him. So he ends up back at the Brotherhood for punishment. Keep in mind, he's betrayed the Brotherhood several times, including, but not limited to, the assumed violent fucking up of the leg of a squire to prevent them from getting the position. He then allowed his knight to die and stole his identity and then lied about having the head to the whole Brotherhood, despite that being the one thing they really want and despite knowing where the actual one really is. These betrayals would, of course, get him killed, yeah? Well, the leader guy says power is taken, not given. And you know what? Maximus has clearly learned that. And so if Maximus can complete the next mission, he can rule with the old dude as his right-hand man. This has become so fucking funny. He injures a fellow soldier and gets upgraded to squire. He watches his knight bleed out and just takes his place. He fucks around in the whole wasteland and then he lies to the whole brotherhood and somehow achieves a promotion. For the sake of the brotherhood, please listen to him. For the sake of the brother, this bitch lied and betrayed the brotherhood like three different times. Oh, he just so happens to know exactly where what we need is the very moment he's about to be executed. Hmm. Oh, I surely believe him now. Throw him in the fucking brig, give us the location of the head, and if you are telling the truth, we might not kill you. But that's for a world where things start to make sense. In any case, and for reasons I do not know how, Maximus knows where Moldava is, and so he directs the Brotherhood of Steel over there. There's a big war, everyone dies, and then he somehow ends up in a position where he's promoted again. Like, I'm not even kidding, Maximus fails miserably. However, he's seen as the one who killed the enemy leader. This means that he gets to be a knight now. He got fucking promoted again. What the fuck? What, he just fails upward. I guess it's good the writers wrote what they knew. Can't wait to see him in season two. What an interesting plotline filled with twists and turns and absolutely insane nonsense. I assume I don't need to spend much time on this. Maximus is a shite character. A collection of random values and actions per the scene he's currently occupying. A pathetic exploration of an admittedly difficult to write character. One who's self-centered and power hungry thanks to a history of understanding that the Brotherhood represents that very power he never had. He likes the idea of being seen as the stalwart hero of the people but can't escape his selfish nature. They awkwardly and wonkily walk him through coffee-stained photocopies of better scenes where in theory his ethics would be tested, yet in actuality he continuously stumbles around with a scornful face until the story can come to a temporary end. What an unlikable piece of shit. His final significant act was that of trying to help Lucy by sending the Brotherhood of Steel to the Observatory, a place the Brotherhood then bombard with all kinds of artillery. She could literally have died within the first five minutes of the assault and he doesn't seem to recognize that at all when making the decision. In fact, a good summary of Maximus as a character would be to describe events in episode one, that his friend covers for him and treats him well while everyone else in the Brotherhood kicks the shit out of him and when that same friend gets promoted, Maximus is so angry about it he screams at a toilet. The sad part being Max's elation and approval of Dane's injury, meaning we can't even imagine he was angry that he'd be left alone. He's literally just a pathetic, jealous vacuum of potential. He's actually just like Finn, only where he was robbed of a trilogy's worth of development in favor of simping for Ray Palpatine, Max here was tanking his own potential from the first second he had on screen. Fuck Maximus, he's a boring loser. <laughs> But hey, with him out the way, it'd be nice to check out, you know, some some of the good characters, right? Why not Lucy? Everyone likes Lucy. Lucy's great. Uh, let's talk about Lucy. Once she leaves the vault after that initial raid, she ends up setting up at night with a fire. Lucky for her, she happens to cross paths with the main man of the show. The one everyone is after, Mr. Wilzig. He warns her how stupid it is to sleep with a fire out in the open at night, when I would argue it's monumentally stupider for him to be sitting down next to her when he's the most wanted man in the wasteland at that point. He's very much not able to defend himself, and he's carrying material that means open, free, and clean energy to the people of California. He considers his mission to be of utmost importance, and he's gambling it all on some lady he sees, which kinda looks like it would be a trap. But, I mean, writing is hard these days, so shut the fuck up. I just want to point it out, this man is directly connected to Moldava, and that is the exact person that Lucy wants to see. What a coincidence, it doesn't 
doesn't matter, we're moving on. Lucy decides to check one place in one town, and it just so happens to be the place that has been paid to protect Wilzig. Wow, what a coincidence. And she just so happened to meet him the prior night. Wow. Unfortunately for them, the ghoul is sitting right outside, and he wants Wilzig too, for the bounty. Oh no. How inconvenient. If only it had been literally any other store, in any other town, at any other time. Hell, if only Wilzig had walked in through the back, eh? Gosh darn. This just so happens to also be the time that Maximus arrives. All of these events happening at exactly the same time are the whole reason anything happens in this show. In any case, she ends up having to take the head, because Mr. Wilzig kicks the bucket. She settles down for the night with a fire after being advised not to because fuck it. Oh, and she passes an assault tron. Look, it's an assault tron reference. It has no relevance to anything. It's, re it's re references. Remember this and no story. She is then sidetracked and attacked by a gulper. You guys should seriously understand that Lucy was lucky as fuck to have been attacked by this thing and not eaten whole when it has the same ninja powers as the Yao Guai. Also, had she simply walked by this area, the ghoul would have caught up with her, killed her, taken the head, and the show would have been over. That gulp is saving lives. The ghoul eventually catches up to her and they have a tussle. She bites off his finger and so he cuts off hers. I got that habit of me. Lucky for her, just minutes later, she gets a new finger from a robot that wants to carve her up for organs anyway. That makes sense. You see, the ghoul wants to trade her in for vials so that he doesn't go feral. Regardless, she's strapped down at the arms, but not the legs, allowing her to escape with ease by somehow kicking the saw into her restraints to then fuck up the robot with a defibrillator. Not sure that any of that works, but whatever. She then forces the release of ghouls who are kept in cages and are feral. As a result of this, everyone dies, and she doesn't seem to realize it's her fault. My name is Martha. Your name is Martha. Why did you say that now? She even kills one herself, and doesn't deal well with that fact for about a minute, and then it never comes up again. The irony being that she provides vials to Mr. Ghoul outside without realizing that she could have given them to Martha, who is like a ghoul inside, instead of just shooting her. It's amazing that Lucy just keeps winning despite all odds that she should lose. At least she earns it, right? It's not like it's insane luck every single fucking time. I didn't even mention the time that Maximus outran a fucking bullet to save her. Not to mention the ghoul deciding not to kill her a million times in a row, whereas he would have killed anyone else. But I mean, whatever, she's quirky, she's fun, she's aloof, she makes you, she's a funny decision. I mean, credit to the actor, but the writing is horrendous. Oh, for fuck's sake, Lucy didn't even loot the Super Duper Mart, man. How do you forget to do that in a Fallout show? She didn't grab up additional clothing, water, food, ammo, guns, or even a fucking bag for anything she might find. But she sure did grab a reference, something she drops in just over an episode, without using. Remember this, remember this, remember this, and no story. Ugh, she walks out of there like she owns the place and leaves every valuable resource to the next scavenger that'll simply waddle by. Anyway, she's about to die from radiation, but she stumbles across Maximus in his suit. Pleased to make your acquaintance, actually. Let's get the other bit of politeness taken care of, shall we? What the bloody, bloody... Bloody hell are you doing here? And she does this when he's about to die by being eaten by rad roaches. Wait, hang the fuck on. Hold the fucking phone. This ain't even some big coincidence. It's a good old gosh darn plot hole. Thaddeus left in the night with the head, and Lucy is following the tracker she placed in the head. She would then trace it to its real-time location, meaning she should be far away and moving in a completely different direction. How do you fuck up so much in your stupid goddamn show? I really want to believe you, but practically every person I've met up here has tried to kill me. Woman, this is the one man who took 25 bullets for you in Philly. Thank you. They have a conversation while he is tanking bullet after bullet for her. How the fuck does she not remember this? She cited this. Moron! 
And so they happily save each other by her releasing him from the suit and him providing her right away. So she bumps into the fiends with Maximus and they end up in Vault 4 because they're looking for a solution. Only Lucy's end of the story is that she spots that the people of Vault 4 drink blood and decorate themselves in the ashes of the dead while saying blood must spill to bring Shady Sands back. What did they mean by this? No, seriously, what did you mean by the people who like the NCR and Shady Sands being obsessive naked blood drinking ash bathing weirdos? Anyway, she tells Maximus none of this while saying they should leave. This is what we call retarded. She wasn't allowed on floor 12 and yet she went to floor 12 where there was like horrible experiments and stuff. It turns out the experiments aren't actually experiments. They're just, they're just trying to save people or something. It just, it looks really bad, but it isn't actually that bad. It doesn't really make any sense because of course, why wouldn't you just tell people that's what's going on? Instead, she assumes the worst and tries to stop them. She throws some acid in someone's face. It's this whole thing. Anyway, after all of this, they decide they can just let them go. Like Lucy fucks all of that up and then Maximus does the Todd Rage thing where he breaks a bunch of shit. He also happens to steal, I'm not kidding about this, steal their entire source of energy. He just pops it in his power armor and he's like, yeah, it's mine now. You'd think there'd be consequences for something like this, but Vault 4 just let him go with their energy source. I feel like I should explain the cosmic fucktardery that is Vault 4 at this point. The gist of it is, this vault was run by scientists who believed they were the best fit for the head of society. They ran unregulated experiments on their vault dwellers and eventually those same vault dwellers killed the scientists. Ever since, the future generations of those very experiments have now taken in any wayward souls passing by and falling into their traps. They take care of them and they supply them with anything they need. The vault is actually filled with people who are extremely welcoming. However, they have a mysterious level 12 in which no one is allowed to go but anyone can enter. In level 12, they have people recovering from the experiments conducted all those years ago. And you know, they have a little cult meeting to pray to Moldava to recover Shady Sands because many refugees from that event came to live here and desperately want their home back. They drink and bathe in blood while smothering themselves in ashes of the dead while chanting, Bring back Shady Sands, blood must spill. Bring back Shady Sands, blood must spill. And somehow the denizens of Vault 4 don't see what all of that and level 12 would mean to someone with no context. They punish Lucy for being terrified and trying to help people she thinks they're trying to hurt. Obviously the common counter for this is, but they're retarded, which is actually a common defense for most of the characters in this show. Why not have them be dumb? But it's uniquely frustrating in the case of Vault 4 with their understanding of the situation. Their great grandparents had to escape horrors, and as a result we are shown the people who remain understand the value of social and humanitarian programs. They save surface dwellers and they try to bring people destroyed by experimentation back to a quality of life. For causing harm to a fellow survivor, you are hereby sentenced to death. Not a huge surprise when she's fucked up a society without discovering more context, I suppose. Unfortunate, but there we are. Death by banishment to the surface! I get this is fun for shows where the stakes go as far as being late for school or missing your first date, or you get scenes where people misunderstand everything leading to a payoff like this. But these people have been through hell and back. They know how social cues work. They aren't trying to scare anyone. Which means the only real defense of Vault 4 is that they are complete fucking idiots. Kinda spits in the face of them overthrowing scientists. It also makes you wonder how they've gotten this far when they're so easy to take advantage of. Moldava and her group of raiders could easily have taken Vault 4 if they stumbled into it, and the world is filled with plenty of groups like that. It's a bit odd to portray them somewhat savvy in human interaction, health, and security to then do the opposite of that straight away. I mean, it's funny how the peaceful, loving, understanding people of Vault 4 grab a fucking harpoon the second a person who's been experimented on might have gotten out of their cage. It definitely matches their approach and their characters, and it's not at all a thing that happened to bait and switch the audience. Why do they not have security on their entire energy? system? Why would you reward people with freedom and two-week supplies when they actively try to sabotage your society? Why tie her up? Why have a rigmarole of a ceremony and word everything in such a way that a person being punished would believe they are about to die when that is entirely the opposite of your intentions? Why wouldn't they show newcomers what they do on level 12 instead of letting people stumble across it? I already know. Yeah, they're retarded. That's how this whole show works. Everyone we've just met is now a complete joke despite the histories they share. Nothing that took 
place meant anything for both weight and consequence outside of a small hiccup. Our characters made decisions that they should reckon with, but don't. And it's all because this was like a side mission in a video game. And satire apparently means tossing bullshit at a wall. This defensive and reflexive shutdown of standards means the show no longer requires dramatic weight, consideration, or consequence. Once the plotline is over and the writers want to do something else, we can pull the It's Satire card and be done with it. And I think we all know that if this show actually behaved just like a video game, with characters walking around like NPCs, or experiencing loading screens, or choosing to enter prior saves, it would not be considered a boon to the experience. That would destroy the already very crippled TV show stakes. Turns out, they are different mediums. It also turns out it's much more complicated as to what the correct decisions are when balancing tone and maintaining stakes in an adaptation, but you throw in enough references and it doesn't matter anymore. That's why they're willing to let the whole society die with the two newcomers leaving. Lucy convinces Maximus to give back the power source though, so I guess there's that. Do you know Maximus only has the power armor here because the people of Vault 4 picked it up? And we found his armor. Our surface foragers are bringing it back now. How the fuck did you find that armor? How did you know it belonged to Maximus? Which is funny because it doesn't. How the fuck did you move it back and move it back so fast? The thing weighs tons. Why are you so invested in getting it back to him? Why did any of this insane bullshit happen? Because we don't do consequence here. <sighs> so Lucy's all about doing good deeds, right? And she finds out that Maximus let a man bleed to death and he took his armor when he was sworn to protect him. He was threatening me, so instead of helping him, I watched him die. He mentions he was threatening him, but he also rejects the idea that he's a good man, which is correct. I mean, part of why this is so frustrating is that he just lies to her. Probably should have put this in the Maximus portion, but fuck it. He aims the gun and doesn't shoot. He aims again and doesn't shoot. He then thinks about aiming and doesn't shoot. He then aims and doesn't shoot yet again. He then watches as his knight is being torn apart by the stupid fucking Yao Guai, clearly thinking about how happy he would be if he could just get into that suit. He absolutely chose to abandon his knight to the Yao Guai, leading to his death well before he threatened him. And besides, in actuality, the threat Titus gives him is just a description of the repercussions the Brotherhood will have for Maximus thanks to his inaction during that sequence. The same Brotherhood that Lucy says Maximus should follow the values of. The show thinks Maximus was not only telling the truth here, but that he's developing as a person and getting some repercussions for his actions. You know, taking accountability, which he's absolutely not doing. He lies and then the show has Lucy equate her experiences with his. I just threw acid in an innocent man's face. The wasteland sucks. Yeah. Absolute cunt. To get back to Lucy, though, it is a problem that she doesn't care. It's like one of the most obvious ways to have had an interesting conflict, but they just have her not care about it at all. She doesn't want to know any more context, she just wants to move on. They made it clear that she appreciates context when judging conflict, but I guess she doesn't anymore. Especially since she gives up on it entirely when it comes to Moldava. But we'll get to that. Instead of her pursuing more information, she says, Oh, I, I threw some acid in an innocent man's face face, the wasteland sucks, as if what she did is even remotely close when she was under the impression, for good reason, that these people were being experimented on against their will. Meanwhile, Maximus just wanted more power. It's pretty boring, lame, and totally not in her character, but whatever, let's go! So Lucy and Maximus end up with Thaddeus, like I said. I cannot understate just how incredibly fuck-lucky these idiot mongeese are throughout the whole show, but whatever, it's fun, 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 fun. So after they split up, she enters the observatory safe house and sees it's a one wonderful refuge where everyone is safe and happy. A lot is revealed that we can go over in a moment, and she realizes her dad is a bad man. Though she manages to watch her dad open up power armor and toss out a dead man while jumping in, even though it's the one thing she absolutely would not want him to be able to do. Like, this whole thing happened right in front of a field of view, what are you doing? Anyway, Lucy by the end of the season has no clue what the fuck she's doing and has to rethink basically all of everything. But, she did say okie dokie, which made it all worth it. Outside of the obvious, being Ella Purnell is an awesome actress, let's talk about this character. I may end up looking like you. I'll never. Like you. When looking back, you can see exactly what the plan was for Lucy. She's meant to be the aloof, naive, fish out of water, moving through the world with fun reactions to all kinds of silly and serious events. Eventually, she'll learn the world is harsh and cruel, and she'll need to become a killer. There you are, you little killer. 
We see a lot of this throughout, exemplified by her compliance in almost everything Vault related, but the progression is entirely wonky, and oftentimes a straightforward assassination. You can't have the fish out of water girl who is naive on every single event in the show, while also having her starting scenes be that of a deep and horrifying event. In the totality of her first interaction with people from beyond the vault, she witnesses her lifelong friends and family getting horrifically attacked and murdered on top of her father getting kidnapped. And all of that after sleeping with a man claiming to be someone he wasn't right before he tries to kill her. This has almost no effect on her approach to anything. She talks to everyone as though they'll be very cordial and friendly, including but not limited to a man who's actually killing people right in front of her just before she speaks to him. Not entirely dissimilar in style to what she previously experienced. You have that, you have the impact of a chopped off finger being entirely forgotten in just an episode. You have a missing out on several opportunities when it comes to standard interactions and her attitude in general. You have this girl, this bubbly fun girl from a world where violence is as rare as a birth. She's happily holding a severed human head and chatting with it not long after simply deciding that yes, she will saw it off. It's a fun performance, but it's nowhere near the behavior you'd develop when having lived this person's life, nor is it representative of that person having experienced the trauma that she did. Lucy's awkward demeanor is highlighted by even her fellow vault dwellers and stands in direct opposition to the much more normal disposition and attitude of her father, the man who would have had the biggest influence in her development. People try to explain her by saying she's a vault dweller when she can come across as strange even to them. Her reactions to every one of the people she loves and has lived with for years getting murdered is very restrained in the opening. I understand they did this deliberately, I think it's a mistake. They won't let her portray a more powerful set of emotions as her life is being destroyed in front of her eyes. It's downright awkward when her father is drowning a man in front of her, she's like, oh, well. She watches a friend get his neck torn out and she doesn't seem to care all that much about him. The time they allow Ella a chance to show what she can do emotionally is when her father gets kidnapped. Probably one of the best few isolated seconds of the entire show. You are my world. But this stands in opposition to her prior emotional engagement, and it continues in her incredibly subdued reaction to the world for the first time she sees it, as far as she knows anyway. Witnessing a landscape outside of the vault, a horizon, the sky, the insane nature of this wasteland, I feel like we had better reactions from Rebecca Ferguson in Silo, and she was only looking at pictures of the outside world. And this issue permeates through to the smallest of stuff, like how Lucy will walk by a Brahmin and just sort of smile. It should already be special to her as a cow, but it has two heads. She'll show less emotion when seeing people murdered than when she decides to help out Wilzig. Gosh, damn it, okay. Her curiosity and shock are incredibly selective, and I'm inclined to believe it was entirely a direction problem because I know what she's capable of, and some of the reactions are just strange. And it makes it so much harder to take any of the heartache she experiences seriously. We don't see any kind of emotionally charged decisions representative of the trauma she sustained. Instead, she continues to behave as the Lucy archetype they built in episode 1 until the finale realization. It's not about her continuous reference to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's about how she continuously gets taken advantage of and surprised when she simply doesn't have the backstory to support it. The show wants you to think she has it, but you need to simply remember what's happened to her. I assumed she had at least learned something by the time of reaching Maximus, but those assumptions were dashed when her willingness to trust the fiends rather than keeping a gun trained on them almost costs Maximus his life, especially when he warned her excessively. Lucy will actively baffle me in that she will explain just how much she absolutely cannot bring herself to kill the ghoul or leave him to die. You see, those actions would be outside of her ethical system. Alright, gotcha. But then, not scenes later, she has to be convinced to save a man who is not only offering to save her life but has taken as many as 25 bullets for her previously? Maximus is a twat. But she has no reason to think he's anything other than a saint. And so, Lucy's ethical system will dictate that she will save the mass-murdering ghoul in a heartbeat, but when it comes to a man who 
saved her life and is currently suffering while offering to save her life again? Well, apparently she's gonna need some convincing for that one. Lucy often gets reset because they don't want to lose the bubbly nature until we're closer to the end. She went through something more horrific than many wastelanders have. They utterly squander the characterization and it's propped up as something special. We missed out on one of the only interesting conflicts of morality she could have had with Maximus because the writers didn't know how to handle it. And then she swallows hook, line, and sinker the entire story Moldava feeds to her. Which is probably my biggest problem with how they wrote this character. Lucy is now looking at the woman who is responsible for the death of many of her lifelong friends and family. What she hears from Moldava about her interests don't come fucking close to being representative of her actions in the vault. She could have dropped a necklace on a random ghoul. She can easily lie about Lucy's father in any way, shape, and form. Ultimately, Lucy has no clue nor reason to believe any of this, yet she buys in fully. A huge betrayal of the way they built her throughout. They imply her connection to her mother is stronger than with her father. This is despite the fact that she spent the vast majority of her life with her father and not her mother. It's actually extremely annoying that Lucy is convinced by such a shitty story. You see, her mother realized there was a civilization outside because their water was being siphoned off, when that can be explained easily by a loss of water through damage, through someone siphoning it from within the vault, or through some animals getting at it. In fact, there are countless explanations before thinking humanity has re-emerged. Besides, the show supports that she was correct, but Vault 33 is in the middle of a wasteland desert. There's no town for miles. Who is actually siphoning the water? What was happening? And even if it were happening, Hank was absolutely right. Do not wander the fucking radiated wasteland to simply check if there are people outside. And if you decide you have to, you need to confirm it's safe. Do not randomly endanger the children. Are you insane? In any case, if Rose truly believed there were people outside that she just had to get to, then why does nobody else in the vault know this story? Why is it that Rose would have left with the two kids and not told anyone about this incredible news? Would she not convince them as part of the goal of the vault that they need to get out there and restart civilization? Wouldn't she at least leave them a note? Nobody should be buying this story. And it's a pity Lucy does, though not the only instance, considering she also bought the story from Vault 4 after a few seconds of explanation and a contextless clip. It's as though, despite her stating otherwise, that she has no idea people can lie. She's also supposed to be so adept at conflict de-escalation, along with experiencing some of the worst pieces of shit in the wasteland. I guess she didn't listen to the ghoul's advice. As what people say they did, and what they really did. Somehow, we're now at a point where people who spend the entire show dead are being assassinated as well. <sighs> Look, if you want to have it so that she realizes she can't even trust her father as some kind of arc, you can't have it so that Moldava, the hyper-murderer, convinces her he's a piece of shit. That doesn't make any fucking sense. And it's indicative of the absolute laziness of this script. And no, I'm not even in the adjacent dimension of accepting Lucy unlocked all of her memories and realized the truth when she saw Mother Go as an explanation. When it comes to something this important, you cannot rely on your garbled perspective of your own early childhood memories. Especially when someone you absolutely cannot trust, who has a vested interest in you joining her side, is manipulating you. And what a convenience that the six-year-old simply didn't remember any of it before now. Consequently, it would have gotten in the way of the story otherwise. But of course, they then later have Cal McLaughlin confirm it all through just the shittiest dialogue. They rushed the end, and as a result, Lucy is just a tool of the writers to encourage a sense of, haha, fish out of water, but oh wow, deep character, realizes father bad, wow. Oh boy, this wasteland is tough. But hey, that's okay, we haven't gotten to the best character yet, have we? The ghoul. If we fast forward to when he's in the town, it's so strange that he's willing to attack basically everybody, when if they get one shot in his head, he's just dead. Which, by the way, is very easy for anyone to pull off, but they don't. It's kind of crazy, because he just shoots everybody, but when it comes to Lucy, no, 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 he'll consider. He'll, he'll think about it. Which is odd, considering his history. You'd think vault dwellers are not exactly people he cares about that much. I mean, we see him try to kill her several times. It's just that whenever he has a chance to actually do it, he doesn't. In any case, after Mr. Maximus tanks the shot for Lucy, Mr. Ghoul over here decides he's not gonna stop. I was trying to count it in the scene. I think he fires nearly 30 rounds at the power armor. It's absolutely fucking nuts. Mainly because they don't do anything. The only reason he has a chance at surviving 
losing this fight is because Maximus is retarded and he gets his foot stuck. Though it is curious that the ghoul wants to defeat Maximus in a one-on-one -on -one and spends 30 shots on him not killing him, it's almost as though he's unaware of a very obvious weak spot that he could take advantage of. Seriously, he keeps chucking him instead of crushing his head. So anyway, when catching up to Lucy, she's accidentally had the head get eaten by some giant fish thing. This means the ghoul tries to use her as bait to get the fish up so that he can try and get access to the head. Oi, you fucking goober, are you aware that bait is supposed to be on the hook for this to work? Oh wait, we can't do it that way because Lucy would have died unless you luck out and it just eats the hook? How the fuck are you strong enough to pull that out of the water? What? Unfortunately, because he's a hyper retard, he leaves his vials in his bag next to the girl next to the monster. Like, look at this shot here. He's left his bag, which has all the material that prevents him from going feral, right in the middle of the fight between the girl and the giant fish. So unfortunately, the vials get destroyed. My goodness, what sudden and dilapidating retardation. Maybe he would have had better luck if he just shot the fucking thing with his gun instead of trying to poke it. There wouldn't be any concern of damaging the head when he's a sharpshooter and there's a clear difference between this thing's head and its stomach. However, lucky for him when he trades the girl for vials, she does that whole insane escape and then she provides vials to him. He gets enough so that he can actually get into the supermod and take advantage of a full chest of vials. He starts putting them in his fucking hat. Just take the chest. Anyway, he sleeps for just too long and gets knocked out and kidnapped by people who want him dead, though he doesn't die because... They're retarded. Yeah, you did it, yes. Why not have him be dumb? The lucky fuck is then allowed to sew his finger back on and then they try to kill him and he somehow escapes because... because be, be. <laughs> What can I even say? The funny thing is, they want to kill him for what he did at the Super Duper Mart, but he, he didn't do it. He could have said he didn't do it. There was nothing to lose. It almost comes across as him covering for Lucy, but he could just make up a person that attacked the place. He could, you know, lie and say he stumbled in after, which is actually partially true. It felt like there was nothing that was going to drag him into the main story again, so they had to just spawn these guys. And spawn them they did, and kill them he did. Only to then spot a wanted poster of Moldava, someone he recognizes from his past. But then why the fuck is this the first time he's seeing this? He's a bounty hunter. She's famous. You're telling me he gets woken up and discovers as much information as he can on a bounty that was spread across six agencies, but he's never come across Moldava? Aren't we told several times that she's like world famous? This is the first he's come across. Okay, whatever, fine. He then somehow found and killed Rufus, a man who was sent by Moldava to pay Tommy who he then also found to find out where Moldava is. The ghoul then kills Tommy because Tommy wanted retribution for his brother, something the ghoul predicted, but then he turns his back and slowly walks away from the father, whose sons he just killed. I guess there's no worry of retribution there. The next significant time we see him, he kills a whole battalion of Brotherhood, including three power armor suits by hitting them in their weak spots. The way they edit it, you'd be forgiven for thinking he killed like seven of them. Absolutely. Absolutely sad and pathetic. If you're so good at killing him, why'd you waste 30 shots on Maximus? And don't give me that bullshit about armor piercing rounds. Motherfucker clearly has those same rounds in Philly, and even if he didn't, why did he then retardedly spend 30 shots on armor he knows he can't penetrate? It's not like ammo is precious in the wasteland. Anyway, the ghoul has Hank on the ropes and chooses not to shoot him in the weak spot, instead grazing him in the face. When this is lampshaded as antithetical, he says he's going to follow him like a stuck pig. Which, first of all, is not how he's done anything in this season. But second, why not get your answers now? How the fuck you gonna follow him? You didn't shoot him with a tracker, you grazed his face. Which takes us to the end of this season for the ghoul. He's gonna chase Hank and he's gonna take Lucy with him now for some reason. He's also got dog meat. Like, if I was to trace this story, he stabs the dog to death. He then stim packs it back to life. He then ditches it at the spooky monster head sequence, which doesn't make any sense. They want me convinced the dog will follow him this far, but then she just decides to stop as he slowly walks away after the giant fish part. Regardless, the ghoul then picks the dog back up because he coincidentally stumbles across her in a Nuka-Cola cooler thingy. I assume from there the dog will be his companion in season two, but like, did the writers watch the show? The dog was brought up entirely by Wilzig. She would have loved him more than anything. Entirely as loyal and as passionate as one would expect a dog to be. The ghoul injured the hell out of Wilzig and the 
the dog attacked him for it. You get the stab, he then provides the instant heal, which she's not gonna understand, and she doesn't continue attacking? The guy fucking stabbed her, shot her master. The dog would not show trust or loyalty to the fucking ghoul. The worst part is how the dog doesn't seem to give a single shit about Wilzig's well-being. She just moves along to team up with the ghoul. None of this is emotionally satisfying, and none of it makes any sense. I think there was an idea of the dog following Wilzig's scent to his body, hence the ghoul's reaction here to now having a lead. Only that falls apart, because if it were true, he obviously would have caught up to Lucy and Wilzig, considering how ridiculously slow they were moving. Instead, they show them leaving at night time? Why? That means they waited so long they didn't leave until Wilzig had died. If the dog wanted to find her master, then why is she not only not attacking the ghoul, but waiting around for him? They even want you to think the ghoul is using the dog to find the head through her interest in following Wilzig's scent in episode 7. The scent of this fucking head. I feel like they knew they just had to have a dog and didn't give a shit to write anything for her because people like dogs and it's a reference to dog meat and that's enough. Just more wasted potential. Anyway, the ghoul is just carried by Walton Goggins. Everyone knows that. It's got nothing to do with his journey or how it's written. He's a guy who can make a scene work no matter how much stupid shit is happening in it. I am genuinely thankful he made the show more bearable. And let's be honest, it's hard to assassinate someone like the ghoul because he just does anything anyway. There's not many actions he can take that someone can say is definitively out of character. But believe me, before the series is over, they will find a way. Personally, I couldn't give less of a fuck if he finds his family. But then I struggle to care about anyone in this show. Maybe I'll find substance in Cooper. We'll get to him soon enough. The ghoul, however, is hollow entertainment. Something I welcome in this bog. I'm just happy to see Walton Goggins shooting people in great makeup while acting. You probably get two worthwhile scenes, the first being his reflection on his past and future, though this did feel like a scene that could have come up in any episode at any time. It's essentially a meaning freebie to bank whenever you want. To have the ghoul watch his past self play a character that would have killed his current self in a heartbeat. To reflect on his corruption. As a moment, it is solid. Then there's the scene of him shooting his friend and eating his flesh. The text being, he just shot him to eat him. The subtext being, he just saved his friend from a horrible fate and is ultimately being pragmatic about eating him. Even giving him something good to think about before killing him, obviously reflecting on his own potential fate. Still, he could have been so much more, but in a show with characters either entirely lacking potential or ending up inconsistent when comparing almost every connecting scene, I find it refreshing that they managed to make one that is universally liked through essentially the base performance. They didn't even have to write much of a story, and to be honest, the ghoul doesn't really have one. But maybe he will in season two. So yeah, those are the three main characters. Their stories are mostly them bouncing around random shit happening until the end suddenly arrives. Their choices, what few there are, seem to be a bit of a lottery. And you can see it's not so much they want to tell a story with three characters going on journeys, it's more so that you just want to have stuff happen to these people. Random stuff. Just keep having random bullshit happen because at some point someone might realize nothing's happening. We could talk about Lucy's brother, he's, he's another character I suppose. His name was Grimby. He stayed in the vault and he was demoted for being reckless with the door. He seemed suspicious of stuff. He went over to Vault 32, which has not been secured by Betty despite her knowing the truth. But then again, maybe she didn't? In fact, what's incredibly odd about the entire scenario is the utter disinterest shown by Vault 33 as to the situation in Vault 32. You'd think that after the raid, they'd be interested in getting to Vault 32 as fast as possible to confirm the front vault door is closed and secured. That was something that in the council scene, they seemed passionately interested in. You'd think they'd be interested in collecting the Pip Boys, considering they all act as keys to the vault doors for some reason, and maybe they'd want to secure the armory? You'd think they'd want to just be a tiny bit invested in checking to see if anyone is alive in there. Perhaps hiding. Perhaps they need to deal with the dead. It's honestly bizarre that none of them want to check to see what happened. I mean, the water chip gets broken, and for some reason, nobody, including smart boy Grimby, suggests using the water chip from Vault 32. But, like, you know, they're a Hearted, right? That's why all of this definitely makes sense. Though, considering the nature of both Betty and Harper, did they know? Was there any interest from Betty or Bud as to what the fuck happened in there with no contact for so long? I suppose I'll have to continue on with both the idea of Betty knowing and not knowing at the same time. In any case, all of what happened in Vault 32 could have been revealed, but it just isn't. If anybody asks what we were, I'll we'll have a heart attack. Like, it's really strange that he goes over there and discovers that everyone's been dead for way longer than they could have been if the Raiders had killed them. 
all you've got to do at that point is, you know, tell everyone. And that easily could have happened, even with Betty knowing that was a potential. But whatever, they weren't lucky enough to discover the truth because the people who died in 32 only scrawled, we know the truth and we know what's in there, in blood on the walls. Like, what kind of retard discovers the truth and then writes with the goal of informing, we know the truth on the walls? What the fuck is wrong with you? Of course you killed yourself. So anyway, Grimby knows something weird is going on, and it was prompted, by the way, because a raider said, hey, you know what? The Vault 32 people weren't so innocent. He heard that, and then just, like, didn't ask him a bunch of further questions. Yeah, I, I would personally ask him a bunch of questions. So anyway, then Vault 32 is, like, cleaned up in a day. What a difference a day made. Even Grimby doesn't know how the fuck they pulled that off. Betty and Harper couldn't have done it on their own. We see no Mr. Handys in any of the vaults, and if it was Bud that sorted it all out, I think we're all wondering how the fuck that would be possible. Obviously now he's very sus. He even asks about his mother's Pip-Boy because that was used to enter Vault 32. This, by the way, is not worrying enough to Betty. Like, she doesn't think Grimby is compromised, even though asking about that is, is like, it's very obvious that he's discovered something. In fact, I'd argue it's downright out of character for him to have asked such an incriminating question to the person he's quite suspicious of when there's no real reason he would expect to get any information that would be useful to him at all. Also, the Raiders get poisoned, so there's no more getting information from them or using them as proof. So then Betty splits Vault 33 into two. She sends the other half to Vault 32. When knowing Bud's plan, this is bizarre. There are just 35 people left after all the death and destruction with as many as five beyond a viable age. That means Bud has 15 people per vault to restart their populations. There is no option here other than reawakening many managers. I suppose that's a problem for season two. Something season one didn't deal with, however, is Betty and Bud's decision not to pursue Hank when his knowledge not only allows their key competition to unlock infinite energy, but that she's at least somewhat aware of their operations and intent. But they seem to think that's all fine and they can continue as normal. That's a bit weird. Why don't they just nuke the NCR again? Considering the characters as written, that would solve all of their problems. Have them be dumb. Anyway, Grimby decides to simply hack into the Overseer's account and discuss things with the Overseer of Vault 31. This is an insane breach of secure information as well as sensitive data that he simply does because he does a little video game thing. Look, it's a reference. It's like the minigame. Look at that. That's an excuse to have shit writing. I guess nobody thought to ever do this in the entire history of Vault 33. I also guess there's no way of stopping it. Brilliant. Bud has no checks, no clarifications, no secret code or message for confirmation, nothing secure because he's... Come on, he... What is he? Come on. He's retarded. Yes. Dom, dom, dom. You know, if it is this easy to just hack past shit, then why not hack past the code Vault Tech dropped on the Cold Fusion? Let's get Grimby on that. Save the whole world, buddy. So Grimby gets an invitation to Vault 31 and he enters. The defenses are pathetic and the secrets are not guarded at all. Bud, the brain, is aware of how sensitive this information is and so traps Grimby in the room. The room with the information and the controls. I guess the stupid brain fuck wasn't smart enough to just lock the door in the first place. Grimby wouldn't have found anything if he just closed that door. You know, something that bothers me to no actual end with this bullshit is that Bud just locked Grimby in the only room he can have leverage in. Had he locked him between the vault door and this room, Grimby is fucked. Instead, in here, he can threaten to kill managers, and that would ruin Bud's entire plan that he idiotically explained not moments ago. Because the future of humanity comes down to one word. Grimby can also threaten to simply wake them all up to cause chaos. Maybe they would demand to be released after what Grimby would tell them. But you know what? Grimby can just threaten to fucking kill Bud. Just pick him up and threaten to drop him upside down and he'd be dead. It's all so fucking retarded. Bud has essentially provided him the console. I'm sure season two will handle whatever happens next in a very intelligent way. The show is only kept online 
life support by coincidence. It is filled with them, left, right, and center, constantly shoving anything and everything on screen whenever the writers have run out of gas. Remember this, remember this, remember this, and no story. Not that it had much gas to begin with, considering Lucy, Max, and the ghoul all happened to meet up at exactly the same time and place, not to mention essentially everything about all the characters' plot lines. Take the ghoul, for example, like how he's heading to the observatory from this guy's house only to end up passing through the exact same gas station as Thaddeus, allowing him to get the dog back. Or like how Lucy and Maximus head back to the entrance of Vault 4 to drop off the fusion core in mere frames before easily catching up to Thaddeus. They traveled from here to here to here instantly. Moments like this are throughout and they make the wasteland feel fucking tiny. I think something that bothers me and bothers a lot of people to be honest is the fact that there are no consequences in this show. Only it's more so that there are no consequences most of the time. There will be consequences when the story is allowed to progress. For example, the water chip is broken, leaving the vault dwellers with a ticking clock and this doesn't account for the water needed for the prisoners. Don't worry, it doesn't come up again. The funny thing is, the solution is the water chip in 32. But ha ha, it's a game reference, but ha. They told us basically nothing about the Enclave, but like, if that's where Wilzig is smuggling the cold fusion from and they're aligned with Vault Tech, then how haven't they cracked infinite energy? Shouldn't they now be the dominant faction in the world? Oh no, that will be the Brotherhood of Steel, because who else would it fucking be? Ghouls now requiring a specific drug to prevent going feral is a bit retarded, because consequently there should be barely any non-feral ghouls at this point. How are they all gonna get access to something so specific? How did they all even find out? Who is maintaining the supply, and how the fuck did Cooper manage it when he was one of the original ghouls? The whole show has Schrodinger's radiation. It'll be allowed into the plot when there's a solution prepared, but other than that, fuck it. Pretend it's not there. In the world of Fallout, I think it's weird that Lucy, a clearly naive idiot vault dweller, is not accosted by many people regularly in her travels who would simply want to kidnap her and find out where her vault is, since those are essentially resource gold mines. I also think it's weird that someone as careful as Barbara realizes that her Pip-Boy is sending out information somewhere when the work she does is incredibly sensitive and she doesn't really care all that much. It's suggested the boys can figure it out for her and she's not interested because she's gonna find the transmission location herself. Which, like, wh why are we not reacting to this for what it is? That could be espionage. It could be fucking company spyware. It could even be Bud doing some weird shit. Why the fuck would you establish that and then have her take it into one of the most secret meetings ever conducted? <sighs> consequences. To switch gears, but to stay on theme, the Brotherhood believe that Maximus wanted his friend sabotaged, which goes against what they believe in entirely, and instead of returning to training, he receives a promotion. Maximus fails his job as a squire several times, and he ends up with the suit. Lucy threatens the ghoul, and he shoots to kill literally anyone raising a gun on him, but when it's her, he doesn't. Except, of course, when Maximus is ready to take the bullet. Do it! Kill her! Maximus fucks up his fight with the ghoul, fucks up his suit, fucks up the fight with the people trying to steal the suit, and everything goes all back to normal. Thank goodness the attackers put him in his suit so he could kill them. Otherwise, there would have been consequences. Both the ghoul and Lucy get their fingers taken off and reattached very soon after. Perfect shape, size, length, and uh, that thing looks fucking necrotic. I guess nobody gives a shit. Maximus is shot at in point-blank range by two people who fire first, and he only takes one shot to the arm that's healed the second he and Lucy look for anything that can heal it. The second they need it, they stumble across what is the fallout equivalent of heaven. The ghoul is knocked out and kidnapped by people who want him dead, and through insane circumstances, he escapes. Lucy is kidnapped by the robot who's gonna chop her into pieces, and yet, through insane circumstances, she just escapes. Just fucking properly sedate your victim like any normal, self-respecting serial killer robot. She ain't gonna stay still when you're sawing her organs out. It's a miracle you've harvested anyone up to this point. I mean, from a perspective of the robot. And you know, had Lucy entertained for even an additional second that she could negotiate or run away from the ghoul, she actually would have easily escaped since he would have collapsed right there. Thaddeus's foot is crushed by power armor, and for several episodes he just walks the wasteland, not bleeding out, not fainting from the pain. How lucky! Same thing with the branding, he got over that shit in about five seconds. <laughs> 
so pretty hot. Lucy attacks and disrupts an entire society's operations and receives their ultimate punishment. Two weeks supply of food and water and freedom. Maximus then steals the source of their power and he gets to go free as well. When Thaddeus suggests that he could kill the doctor and steal his medicine, but the doctor says, ah, but I know which ones will save you and which ones will kill you. You know what? Fair enough. But then he uses the medicine, takes the payment and slowly leaves. Why establish you were thinking of taking the medicine and the payment and then not address the obvious? You kill him once he heals you. Hello? This scene is so fucking odd. Is Thaddeus even the kind of character that would kill a doctor? A doctor offering to save him? Is that something the Brotherhood teach? Bear in mind, Thaddeus does not know this man fucks chickens. And by threatening to kill this doctor and steal his supplies, you've put yourself in a position where I would expect him to poison you. And yet you just swallow up that magical bullshit. Also, why the fuck did you offer the Fusion Corps as payment first? Could you not barter for like five seconds? Despite saying otherwise, he should be able to offer caps. We were shown a squire has supplied them. You could offer elements of your clothing, you could offer bullets. The Fusion Corps is so valuable and you're in the wasteland. Can't you pretend to have a brain for like five- You're retarded, no, no, right, right, no, he's retarded, no, I get no. it, I get it. Thaddeus fires 15 shots at mid-range on Lucy and Maximus and misses every single shot. They clearly show Maximus shooting directly at the ghoul, but they won't show any damage when one well-placed shot would put him down for good. I guess he missed all those shots too. Sometimes in the game you shoot and it just misses, sometimes you shoot 50 times and it just misses. Yeah. Only when characters need to be, they are suddenly an ace shot. Like when Maximus bullseyes the ninja Yaogwai, or when Lucy saves Maximus by killing all the rad roaches. I guess the whole accurate to the games thing is a bit flimsy. Now we have plenty of examples of people actually succumbing to their wounds. Even Wilzig got a sort of fix for his leg, but he died soon after. But Thaddeus was fine for ages. Lucy gets a stim pack and some staples and she's in tip-top shape. Maximus, on the other hand, needs days to heal and for antibiotics to take effect. It turns out it's not at all about being accurate to the games, it is instead accurate to whatever the plot needs. You have the ghoul acing headshots here and there, but suddenly, sometimes he's just unable to kill the main character. How about that? Well, it's not just her, is it? It's also Maximus, the other main character. The ghoul himself escapes death against all odds several times. And no, no amount of telling me that the dead characters versus the alive characters are just a matter of who puts stats into luck. But Mubler, it's referencing Fridge Boy and Indiana Jones. Oh, that's why it makes sense Maximus tanked a nuke with a fucking fridge. Raise your storytelling standards. Maximus faces the wrath of the Brotherhood for presumably attacking one of his own, allowing a knight to die, stealing his identity, sabotaging the mission to retrieve the head while not accounting for his own squire that they clearly would have seen running away. And they obviously saw Lucy running running away with a head, they could have chased her, picked her up, and ended the whole story right there. Especially when they know the truth about Maximus, which Thaddeus obviously told them about when he called them in. Thaddeus even thanks him for taking the head, despite knowing it's absolutely the one thing Maximus wants. It's almost as though he doesn't get to be a consistent character at all, and the plot decides every last thought he's allowed to have. Crazy that. So considering all of that insane nonsense, on top of Maximus pleading for his life with the knowledge of the head's current location, he's promoted. Again! Maximus is a part of a mission now that's going to lead to his highest elevation in terms of rank, and then Dane is punished by being put on this mission. How do you keep punishing people with promotions? It's so retarded. They put a fucking ghoul with a pistol against three power-armored Brotherhood of Steel Boys and he wins. Struggled with Maximus though, huh? And then if not the best example of an insane amount of lack of consequences, the ghoul wipes out everyone in that room except Maximus. Maximus is rammed face face first into a wall thanks to a punch from power armor and not only is he not dead, he's getting promoted. Again! He has managed to stumble into the fucking highest ranks of the Brotherhood throughout the season. No, it is not satisfying to watch. It makes the Brotherhood look like fucking idiots. Which is rather well supported in that Max can't even hold on to his fucking gun. On top of that, at any moment of their choosing, a squire can completely disable a knight to the point of killing them. The armor is strong enough to toss debris like the incredible Hulk, but can't punch a Yaogwai to death that just so happens to actually die with one shot to the head. So much for that game accuracy. We get to a point where Lucy has more control than Maximus over his fucking power armor. And as much as she read about power armor in pre-2077 history books, that doesn't explain why she's calling him a knight in episode two. I don't mean to interrupt, but... 
a knight. How does she know to say that? The Brotherhood of Steel is not a pre-war organization. And then there's the smaller stuff that's still just weird. Like how this guy gets shot in the heart, but the ghoul comments on how he's obviously been shot in the neck? They really want to show us he has four chambers in his gun, only to have him fire seven without reloading. <laughs> Ghouls can straight up die when shot in the shoulder, but not if you're the main character. Look at this hook throw. Where the fuck is it going? What the hell did he wrap it around to make it this fucking angle? Also, how can you be this fat in the rationing world of a vault? Lucy mentioned they had a famine. Was that you? Even that opening scene is weird. There's the flash from a bomb not being picked up by anyone because of a flash of a camera. That is not how that works. When the flash hit you, you could see the x-rays of your hands through your closed eyes. In the process of hands over your eyes, you saw every bone in your hand. That's smoke, Janie. It's just a fire. Yes, Cooper. The entire city just happened to catch fire. What, what the fuck are you talking about? Then the shockwave finally arrives and blasts shards of glass at ridiculous speeds into a room full of children and nobody's even grazed. To then show Cooper trying to outrun four nukes on a horse instead of getting into the fallout shelter because he's retarded. I grant it may be difficult to get into the shelter, but one would try rather than braving the nukes. Speaking of which, I have a new topic. You see, and I quote, It's the result of this fruit-bearing collaboration that we're able to make America great. That is the opening line of a discussion between fat cat capitalists talking about the end of the world. You see, vault tech sell vaults. Vaults are much better when the world is being destroyed, if not for the simple reason that that's when they're going to protect you. And so, as they say, rumors of peace have set us back for sure. It would seem that the potential financiers of vault tech are a bit worried. Why invest in a company that's only valuable during wartime? Besides, the fat cats don't understand vaults. Won't people just eat you when you come back out? All of the feral Stone Age level people just running around eating flesh, you know? Well, the solution there is that you stay in your vault for so long that everything outside dies. Yes, isn't that a tempting prospect? They're going to win the game of capitalism, as they actually say, by outliving people. People. That is how we will win the great game of capitalism, not by outfighting anyone, but by outliving them. Because capitalism is all about killing everyone. <laughs> Only there's a problem. Mr. House says, oh, you can find rats and they'll end up eating each other. Who says they'll even survive the vaults? And so, Vault Tech's solution is that all of them can play out several ideas across more than a hundred vaults to create the perfect conditions for humanity. No one needs to know how unethical it is. May the best idea win. To which Mr. House says, there's a lot of earning potential with the end of the world. What the fuck are you talking about, you stupid goblin man? How the fuck is there a lot of money to be made at the end of the world? That would mean the world has ended. Are you retarded? We could overcrowd a vault so people have to compete to survive inside it. What the fuck does that idea have to do with making money? How are you this bad of a capitalist? You've been developing a robot that delivers milk to the front door. I would like to see a vault governed by you. What Delivering me So not only are they hyper unethical capitalists, they're also hyper clowns. What about using a vault to develop a super mutant soldier using illegal immigrants? Why would anyone be excited by that idea when trying to increase the capital of their company? Why do they all want a post-apocalypse once they're told they could experiment with people? But mutually, it's referencing vault experiments from the game. I don't give a shit if they are superficially referencing something from the game. I am talking about the right in this scene, the characters. I am trying to figure out how the fuck the acid-drenched piss factory masquerading as a brain came up with this. Oh boy, they're all just super evil. Which is actually a pretty retarded statement, considering that if he's on board with this whole plan, that means he's on board with nuking the whole world for capitalism. Believe me, my good man, the more people are alive, the more markets function, the more opportunity you have to take advantage of every last buck in circulation, the better off you will be as a fat cat capitalist. You are not going to benefit from the entire world being nuked, and I can't believe anyone would have to explain this to any of these people. But you know what? At least he had a sliver of creative thinking. What if they invest in the vaults and there is no war? What was the point of their money then? How can they guarantee results? By dropping the bomb ourselves. <sighs> So stupid. Why make trillions when we could make billions? 
People have compared Fallout as a satire to Austin Powers, saying that it is no less effective at making fun of villainous caricatures, clearly proving they haven't watched Austin Powers in 20 years, nor are they aware of the concept of tone. Listen to just the soundtrack here. I mean, look at it. Cooper is having an existential crisis while realizing his wife is Satan. This is not Dr. Evil announcing his desire for sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. Why the fuck would you even say that you plan to drop the bomb in front of an entire board of people whose companies rely on things not being nuked? Do you trust them to not simply say, you're a fucking monster and I will never let you destroy the world? Or are we relying on knowing they are capitalists? Meaning, of course, if there's a buck to be made, there's a nuke to be dropped. For the record, I am actually okay with the idea that there is a friendly bomb being dropped on friendly soil, if you can justify it in the writing. What we're being told here is our team of capitalist retards think they can make the most money ever when the whole world is nuked. And of course, if natural tensions and war doesn't provide this situation for them, they will simply nuke themselves to make money. They are sacrificing top dog positions in a capitalist society filled with countless people ready to make money from, so they can run an insane nonsense experiment that destroys everything because money? Because in countless generations, Earth will somehow be better off. Because as you and I know, every hyper-capitalist on Earth wants to end up in a hole with limited resources and activities in order to increase their bottom line. They couldn't think of a way to write this. This is the most cartoonish and retarded possible way to justify this revelation. This isn't space balls, motherfucker. A nuclear event would be a tragedy but also an opportunity. You know what would be a pretty good capitalistic opportunity? A functioning economy. When we are the only ones left, there will be no one to fight. A true monopoly. Fucking kill me, the ultimate capitalist where everyone except me is dead. This is our chance to make war obsolete. Yes, let us make war obsolete because everybody will be dead. What are you talking about? War never changes. Bitch, if you think war needs to be made obsolete because it never changes, then how do you account for the fucking modus operandi of the super manager vaults nuking anyone who isn't them? You have over 100 vaults working to compete, as is your intention. You think that can't lead to war? You think there will be no war when even one vault reemerges and repopulates and controls the entire world? No conflict. Do you know literally anything about humans? And I know, I know, I know. The right would probably say, ha ha ha, but that's the point. The character is wrong that nuking the world is a good idea. A conclusion reached as a result of the corruption of capitalism. If I had a character who passionately believed we could solve gun violence by chopping off everyone's fingers, and that this is the result of the corrupting influence that is the peaceful mindset, as opposed to the individual's values and potential mental issues, I can then make my show say he's wrong too, but that character would still be a complete and utter fucking retard. I hope you guys understand that if I had a top hat wearing, mustache twirling, capitalist fat man announce that he's going to drink the blood of babies in order to turn a profit in America and make it great again, and that it turns out he's actually just doing it because it's fun, I don't get to say, oh, but it's good because satire. Satire does not mean retard. You don't get points for saying capitalism bad, socialism bad, fascism bad, or communism bad. You get points when you do something poignant or intelligent with the commentary. Grow the fuck up up and write something worthwhile instead of telling me that the ultimate capitalist goal is everyone being dead. Except me and my team in the vault. What a sad fucking pit the Fallout franchises dove headfirst into. It isn't hard to lampoon capitalism, but you make it look bloody impossible. Do the writers even know who they work for? Here we are, adapting it uh, for Amazon, which is, you know, not lost on us, the absurdity of it all. It would have been so much better had they stuck to lampooning corporatism, but even then it it fails as meaningful commentary and how absurd they'd take it without bringing the tone with them. If this were Austin Powers and they had a fat guy wearing a top hat and a monocle on Dr. Evil's team who suggested nuking the entire world to increase profit margins, it'd probably be really fucking funny. But here they reveal the plan and the show plays this as the biggest, most serious, dramatic realization for the whole story. They want to be critical of capitalism by expressing fundamental values through these insane characters as so invested in increasing their 
bottom line that they will happily go as far as killing everyone. The people who wrote this treat it as a revelation in the show. There's a series of quotes that relate to the ideas of raising capital, private ownership, utilizing markets, creating a market for products that are financially unsupported, making products out of anything, everything, buying, selling, and, well, winning. All of this churned up with the notion of nuking the planet. Attitude towards capitalism, which I feel like is coming back in a cool way. No offense, but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. And as if that's not bad enough, they decided to rope in Mr. House. The fundamental idea is simply too broken to function. Why would anyone on this entire board, let alone vault Tech, think that erasing 99% of the world, including the vast majority of all infrastructure in all industries, every last trade route and system that was previously available, and all of the people who can spend their fucking money, would lead to a world where they make the most money. And aside from that, the many basic pleasures of life are gone. Friends, family, and social gatherings are significantly cut down, and of those that would remain, they are secluded, limited, and thoroughly fucking miserable by comparison. Then there's the almost complete destruction of luxury items, the loss of lavish vacation spots, the enjoyment of sports and activities that simply won't be available anymore, they won't have their award ceremonies to celebrate themselves, and freedom would be fundamentally annihilated. Why? Why would any of them seriously consider this? Well, because they get to watch a hundred people kill each other as an experiment in some vault. Lucky they all want to see shit like that so much they're willing to set the world on fire. They don't entertain the vaults can be an investment, but they are an incredibly valuable valuable item on the brink of war, sure, but they are valuable as insurance regardless. People like creating, owning, or buying literal fallout shelters. It's not an entire dead end. Hell, are we pretending now that there was no interest in using vault technology for space colonization? But the dead end doesn't even make any sense because they established vault tech has so much power it can direct the government. So the US government has outsourced the survival of the human race to vault -Tec. vault -Tec is a trillion dollar company that owns half of everything. And after 10 years of war, the US government is broker than a joke. If we are to believe vault -Tec acts as a contractor for the government, we know there are many contractors in the world that work directly for the US that create tools, systems, and weaponry that may never get used. This doesn't work the same way as a supermarket selling fucking chicken. This is a major project, contracted for a feared eventuality, and vault -Tec did their job and would have been paid thoroughly. This is not just a project for impending war, but a project for the entire future of humanity. The military industrial complex is no less primed for criticism as any large governmental system, but this show can't even grasp the very basic form of what it's criticizing. Capitalism. Which is a shame because Fallout as an IP, as we know from history, is primed and ready to tackle this. What they think they achieved with this part of the show was the very simple logic of peace leads to vaults making less less money, so let's nuke the world to create demand for them. Killing almost everyone, destroying civilization, and ending the very concept of any functioning market in order to lampoon capitalism. You didn't write good satire, you wrote a depressed teenager's backward-ass thesis on cartoon economic systems with no more value than a rotting meme on Tumblr. Look, bored of crazy characters, just ask yourselves. Even ignoring the apparently far too complicated concept of supply and demand, once you destroy the world and make all the money, what are you going to buy? What? can you buy? Ugh, there's still so much left. For example, our all-American cowboy, who does eventually become the ghoul, starts this show in his movies Killin' Commies. I hope you like the taste of lead, you commie son of a bitch. Unfortunately for his show, Bob is fired and the writing is getting worse. Bob's a bit of a communist. Communists. Our little capitalist cowboy then starts to promote vault tech. Strong enough to keep out the rads and the reds. If I may say, I, I you all are doing a. Uh... God's work here. Only as time goes on, he starts to lose faith in promoting vault Tech. He finds out he's helping to promote Bud Askins. Yes, the very same Bud's Bud's man. You see, Cooper fought in the war, and he was provided West Tech power armor suits that failed through design flaws. In any case, this is where Bud talks about how time is the ultimate killer. Anyway, as Coop decides to go further with these ads, he starts to lose opportunities. Actors shun him, and he can't get as many movie deals. It seems he's almost selling his soul to capitalism. 
and everyone who's critical of his failing principles is being called a red, including an old friend of his, Charlie Whitenife. But what's crazy is he served with Charlie. How is it possible that he's a commie son of a bitch? Hollywood reds. They even got your friend, Charlie Whitenife. Are you kidding me, Charlie? But at least he has Matt Berry as a friend. You're a product, I'm a product. The end of the world is a product. To those of us who can successfully embrace that, I'd say the future is golden. Hmm. I'm having trouble figuring out who the good guys and the bad guys are. Anyway, Cooper's wife explains that she's working with Cooper and Vault Tech despite all of the horrible ethical implications because she wants a good slot in the vaults. Cooper obviously points out he's super rich, so that's unnecessary. They could just buy one anyway. But she says she wants a good spot in one of the good vaults. That is an incredibly suspicious thing to say, and unfortunately for the audience, Cooper is a retard and doesn't ask her anything else about that. Cooper then meets up with his friend who explains to him what fiduciary responsibility means. That the US government have outsourced the survival of the human race to Vault Tech, and Vault Tech is a private corporation that has a fiduciary responsibility. It must make money for its investors, and how does it make money? And how does it make money? selling volts. That's called capitalism, Charlie. Oh boy, yes it is. But you can't sell volts if peace happens. So in this case, capitalism needs war. It has a fiduciary responsibility to prevent peace. Yeah, how are they gonna do that? I don't know. Well, you see, Vault Tech has a lot of power, so the world may just burn down if the people don't do something about it. Our little capitalist cowboy is now having a bit of trouble understanding his own principles, so he goes to one of these communist meetings. Communist meetings? Come on, man. You should come to a meeting. You should learn the truth about where your wife works. And those principles, how much did Vault Tech pay to take them off your hands? You see, he sold out to Vault Tech. He, he sold his integrity to ads. But he has a worthy rejoinder in that he points out, I'm not ashamed to earn a living. There's a lot of money in selling the end of the world. Yeah, apparently, since that motivates all the capitalists in this fucking show. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of money in selling a political ideology that ends in bread lines. Fascist. Okay. <laughs> They called him a fascist. How do you know my wife? My research company was acquired by her division. So Moldova here explains that it was actually Cooper's wife that bought out her cold fusion technology. She was literally going to solve energy, and Barbara from Vault Tech stopped it. Capitalism. She apparently had multiple companies working on this. She would have saved the world. But Vault Tech, remember, they, they want to blow everyone up, so they don't want infinite energy to get to anybody. Did you ever wonder why, as a writer, of course, that when trying to tell the story of the capitalists nuking their own planet and the communists being the greater good, you had to write in what is tantamount to fucking magic. <laughs> it's getting to the point now where Vault Tech are so evil that they will do anything for money unless that thing is also helpful to people. They could patent and sell infinite energy to everyone on Earth and instead they want to fucking blow it up. In any case, she's trying to convince Cooper that his wife is a monster. She is, by the way, but that's besides the point. She wants him to spy on her to learn the truth. That the wife is a horrifying capitalist, that our capitalist cowboy here is a useful fucking idiot who doesn't even know how economic systems work. Hey, I wasn't the one who said it. Do you know what fiduciary responsibility means? I have no fucking idea. I play a cowboy for a living. And hey, maybe he should consider switching sides. I mean, the conversation does end with this banger. I'm not a communist, Mr. Howard. That's just a dirty word they use to describe people who aren't insane. This line comes from the character who bleeds out desperately trying to provide the people freedom and power. She's absolutely the show's hero by the end. It's fucking fascinating. So she convinces him to spy on his wife, which he does, giving you the capitalists decide the most money they can make is at the apocalypse scene, which then connects up with the prologue. He is no longer with his wife. Out of principle, he stops doing ads with Vault Tech, but he isn't back in movies, presumably because of what he mentioned earlier about actors not respecting him anymore. Our cowboy capitalist who began shooting commies and accusing people of being reds has now been flipped. Come on. There you go. Pinko. Yeah. I still took my money. And the next time you see him, he's red. How about that? Red? 
That's red. This plot line is once again worthwhile because Walton Goggins treats it seriously. He's convincing as a man who is genuinely trying to learn more and make the right decision. Unfortunately, it's no less filled with nonsense than every other part of the show. First of all, if Vault Tech have enough corporate power and money to change and direct policy in the government to the point of starting a fucking war, then surely they have enough power to simply envelop the market. Just buy out everyone else in every industry. Become the market. Which, by the way, when including loopholes would be a far more accurate and interesting lampooning of potential holes in corporatism and economic systems. Hell, it could be interesting to have a character that's essentially a reluctant president at that point. The president of the United fucking States of America. Who do you think I was talking about? Who the fuck? Who is it? What? I should kick your fucking ass. Who is this? But oh well, they want to make more money and so the dirty capitalists will encourage total nuclear annihilation? Okay. Cooper spends most of it well acted, sure, but he's far from a discerning human being acting within his own values and interests. He simply believes, communism lady, that the device she gives him allows him to hear the truth from his wife. Unfortunately, he's too brain dead to realize a woman who is in direct corporate competition with his wife, who is ideologically opposed to his wife, and has expressed interest in sabotaging vault including his wife, just handed him what she called a listening device, and he doesn't even entertain that she's the one who will be listening. He has no idea who is listening beyond him, and he has no idea whether she did this to simply use him. She doesn't even say it's compatible with the Pip-Boy, she just said it's a listening device. He's such a dumb fuck gullible idiot that he actively helped perform corporate espionage on behalf of a communist that directly harms his his own wife. It leads to him discovering that vault Tech intends to blow up the world. That's pretty stupid, but let's go with it. Why did he not use his incredible star power and influence to tell the world? Could you imagine how many people would want this story? The very spokesman, the very poster child, the Pip-Boy himself is turning on vault Tech. It's almost as though he didn't even try to stop vault Tech from enacting this plan. Did he not warn people that the vaults are intended as fucking experiments, including but not limited to torture? people? It's very weird that he'll go as far as leaving his wife for her immoral decisions, but he wouldn't warn the world of a fucking thing. And then of course, how do you think you can have Barbara rant and rave about how she's doing all of this, every last part of it, to protect her daughter to then fucking have the nukes go off with her daughter facing the brunt of four of them? Unless she truly didn't care, because it really was about getting that grand capitalistic monopoly after all. <sighs> I just... why would vault Tech not be fundamentally interested in infinite energy. Why wouldn't they finish up cold fusion and use it for themselves as a way of boosting their capitalistic empire? Could you imagine the sheer power they would have as heads of a clean and infinite energy? They could patent it and use it to go to the stars. But nope! They instead want to be crammed into a hole in the ground, causing untold pain to random people. It's a pity that as a result of a war hard fought, the manifestation of distrust for the people of the Fallout world in using communist as an average insult has now become a wedge for the writers of this show to drool their awkward dissertation on the true blight of humanity. For you see, in actuality, the capitalists are the ones who want to drop bombs on America. Makes sense. Then there's the multitude of shitty dialogue. You're a coward. We all are, Norm. That's why we live in a vault. Your ancestors lived in a vault to avoid being blown apart by capitalist nukes. You live in one because you were born here, and now you want to help this woman raise a fatherless child. That is not cowardice, you dopey fucking goon. Why even pick Chet to say the coward line when he was the only one to offer to help Lucy in the wasteland? He's literally the only motherfucker in the entire vault who would leave for her. They took the door control from him because of his decision to help her. During the raid, I got into storage space and I hid. Does that make you angry? Oh, you know what? I, I need to explain the idea that smart people getting angry is more dangerous than stupid people getting angry. I know, I'll talk about how regular boys, they, they get angry and pee on the wall, but clever boys, oh, you don't want to see where that can go. Regular boys can get angry and they'll just pee on the wall. Well, how about Maximus not knowing how his cock works? It gets all big and hard like a big pimple and then it pops. That's actually completely normal. It's gross. There's only so much cringe I could take. When we are the only ones left, there will be no one to fight. A 
true monopoly. That's called capitalism, Charlie. Fucking commie gobbledygook. How about Thaddeus' backstory? They must have worked real hard on this one. And I quote, I got beat up a lot, and this new guy came in, and I said, let's beat him up. Funny idea. And it worked. I was really popular. It was great. I just wish he lived long enough to beat someone else up. Fucking kill me. Speaking of which, there is plenty of painful humor. Come back here right away! That didn't work. This is the weirdest circle jerk I've ever been invited to. Well, what does Mold even want with you? I mean, she steals dads. He left an impression on me. That is the gentleman who showed me his butthole. Goosey McLean. It's Lucy. Nope. It says Goosey. You'll never find out. Oh, he's gonna find out. It was also really weird that they front-loaded a bunch of incest dialogue. Messing around with your cousin, it's all well and good for kids, but I have been unable to find a suitable marriage partner, one I'm not related to. After 10 years of cousin stuff, I'm definitely excited for the real thing. It's not a sustainable long-term sexual practice, you know? Yeah, I know. That's way more dialogue than we need to understand the importance of not fucking your family to increase population. I guess they thought that was too funny not to include, although it was weirder in the marketing. And your kids can mate with other vault dwellers. It's the best dating pool on the planet. In conclusion, I think you should have fun with this show. Enjoy the action scenes, or the scenes with the explosions, or Pip-Boys in the wasteland, and the power armor suits waddling about. To be honest, I don't care. What I care about is the show being heralded as an example of a great gaming adaptation and a well-written story. It is neither of these things, and that's made much worse by the show being explicitly canon to the games. This is a product that wants to show you a bunch of Fallout iconography, that barely even belongs to the people who are making it. You know, Grandma Geneva wanted to blow up Shady Sands. The first thing they bring that up, you're like, what do you want to do? <laughs> even if we buy the awkward fucking continuity of the implied years of the destruction of Shady Sands and focus entirely on definitive information, we have plenty to talk about. We're careful about the timeline. There might be a little bit of confusion in some places. Why does the NCR have such a limited presence? Why is Shady Sands in an entirely different location? Why is the nuking of one city implied to be the destruction of the entire faction outside of a handful of people? That was a moment that landed in the show that also so move things forward in terms of what's going to be happening in the world of Fallout. No, shut the fuck up. What happened with the obvious power vacuum? Where were the hub and junk town if vaults 31, 32, and 33 were so close to the Santa Monica Pier, both of which are NCR? Vault 4 is close to Shady Sands and anything but secret. Why don't they come up when figuring out what options are available to get the water chip in Fallout 1? The Master's plan was all about cracking vaults and finding pure humans to expose to FEV to then turn into intelligent super mutants. His main base was south of the Boneyard and he was active for years. There's no way Vaults 31, 32, and 33 all escaped the Master, his spy network, and his super mutants, especially when they're all out in the open and Vault 4 takes people in at random, allowing full access to the place. I can't have a perfectly good prime normal and not make it one of the chosen ones, now can I? After you tell me where your vault is. The whole show is hinged on their own description of cold fusion, even though microfusion cells have been an ammunition type for ages and serve a very similar function to what we're shown. Granted, it's not infinite energy, but even the fusion cores are portrayed as such, with Vault 4 using theirs as a power source for more than 200 years. And if that's the case, which is entirely not how they're portrayed in the games, Moldava should probably look into this. Then there's the Brotherhood of Steel. Instead of seeing the best warriors in the wasteland, they all come across as goofy, self-centered, bumbling assholes. The Brotherhood of Steel aren't fervent holy warriors that are comprised of only men and throw their own people literally to the bears. They are a sect of ex-military soldiers who decided to rebel against the former government and their experiments with super mutants. They are basically trying to retain technology to keep it out of the hands of maniacal power-hungry people. And they even help the original vault dwellers in Fallout 1. Apparently they now don't teach it or they don't know fuck all about vaults as well. I had no idea people lived in those vaults. What did you think was in them? Monsters. Don't know how the fuck that happened. Now, the Brotherhood of Steel have simply been made into yet another bad guy organization, and that's even if we forget the canon. They pick bloodthirsty, stupid, and pathetic people to promote to high ranks. They have dramatic inconsistencies in gear, to the point they forgot their armor has fucking flashlights. Maybe you would have been able to kill one ghoul between the ten of you had any of you remembered to use it. Do you really think the power armor would just trap its user as though it's a fucking coffin when the fusion core was removed? Just 
a blatantly inept fucking design flaw. Don't even get me fucking started on the power armor. They are seemingly crap, hyper effective, and then crap all over again in just a handful of scenes. They have squires who don't know how their cocks work despite making sure we understand they wank in front of each other. You wanna make my cock explode now? They clearly establish that weakness is found when damage is done to a fellow brother. But that's all Maximus continues to do with promotions being fucking thrown at him left, right, and center. They clear out everything in the observatory on site, but they decide they want to listen to a speech from a fucking ghoul. A ghoul! They hate ghouls. Maximus himself had a personal, powerful motivation to blast this motherfucker away on site. It's like the show doesn't even remember the downright down syndrome boss fight they had. And I gotta say, thanks for dropping the Pridwin into the show. Real good reference. It has no substantive reason to be there, no effect on the future events of the season, and it could have been labeled fucking anything else. However, it has the fun bonus of making the Railroad and Institute endings of Fallout 4 absolutely non-canon. Thank goodness we got the reference. Remember this, remember this, remember this, and no story. Also, ghouls aren't immortal beings with Wolverine healing superpowers created by drinking magic chicken fucker juice. They are often slow withered old men and women that just so happen to live a very long time and are extremely resistant to radiation. Why have this take place in California? You have so much of this world to explore and yet you are here again. It's like Star Wars and its obsession with Tatooine. And the funny thing is, you can easily add to the lore without stepping on pre-established stories if you just fuck off somewhere else. Obviously the Great War was not a vault tech inside job. It was an extension of the Cold War. There was an ongoing proxy war with America on one side and China on the other. It is confirmed in multiple games and by the original game's creators that China nuked America first. That started the chain reaction that led to the wasteland. We were winning too, and then those damn Reds launched. We barely got our birds up. And then there's what they did to Mr. House. Give me 20 years and I'll reignite the high technology development sectors. 50 years, and I'll have people in orbit. 100 years, and my colony ships will be heading for the stars to search for planets unpolluted by the wrath and folly of a bygone generation. It's a lot of earning potential with the end of the world. Why is it that Mr. House was only able to mount a suboptimal defense of Las Vegas as a result of the bombs arriving before the platinum chip when he is now a member of the board and fully aware of who is dropping the nukes and when? Retard. This show will rely heavily on video game knowledge to fill in gaps, generate headcanon, and excuse awful writing, yet you are punished for knowing anything about the games because the show actively fucks with them at every turn. Now that's not to imply the lore was perfect before this bowel movement slithered onto Amazon. I understand nothing has been perfect for a while and Bethesda has been fucking around for a lot longer than that, but man if it isn't some of the most egregious free flow adaptation vomit that I've seen in a long time. This next part is something I'm going to read out from a username named Zoraz from the Character Rant subreddit. The original post will be linked in the description. The New California Republic was created as a direct result of the actions of the character in Fallout 1. They inspired the daughter of the leader of Shady Sands to inspire her father, Aradesh, to reach out to near-lying settlements to organize and work together. We saw the results of this in Fallout 2. Tendi is now an old woman and the NCR's second president. Shady Sands, which was built from scratch, not on the ruins of an old city, had become a city. They had working crops, working water purification, electricity, and following the defeat of the original Enclave, they would keep growing, unifying most of California with their own gold-backed currency. Ultimately, these growing tensions grew to a clash with the Brotherhood of Steel on the West Coast, whom, similarly to the NCR, had started expanding outwards. They disliked the propagation of technology among other factions. The Enclave had already hurt their previous high horse position, and the NCR was now threatening to take on their duties as well. Only more egalitarian and way more liked by the average wastelander as they weren't a techno-feudalistic cult. The Brotherhood of Steel, NCR War, was devastating, but ultimately the NCR left it victorious. The remnants of the Brotherhood of Steel fled to their remaining bunkers and isolated themselves from the world. The future of California was in the hands of the NCR. However, before the Brotherhood lost, they slagged the NCR's gold reserve, something that crippled their economy, especially as the bottle cap had been favored out to limit the influence of the water barons in the hub, but it was now forced to have a comeback. Enter New Vegas, the 
last mainline game by Obsidian who wrote the NCR. At this point, the NCR is in danger. Famine, alongside resource shortages and growth pains, have forced them to send out scouts in the hope of finding new resources, especially water and electricity, which leads them to Hoover Dam and the war with the Legion. While Vegas is open-ended, it was clear that the NCR did have some troubles. However, it's still a huge nation, even if it lost, it's not clear it would fall, especially as their army would have shorter supply lines and easier reorganization. At this point, they existed for a century, enough time to create a national identity of sorts. Even if there was unrest and many critiques, it was not doomed. Yet now we have the Fallout TV show. Instead of dealing with trying to explain what happened or how they would have collapsed, they were just randomly nuked off screen. All of the NCR seems to be gone. Shady Sands at this point is apparently a pre-war city as well. And that's that. It's gone. The Brotherhood of Steel, which were at the brink of defeat, were brought back to the pseudo-antagonists because God forbid the Brotherhood of Steel isn't a major player or the most powerful faction around. The Enclave is also back, which while we know Chicago still existed, they were fucked in their old form in Fallout 3. And it just breaks the heart. We had this faction that, while not perfect, greedy, sometimes morally grey, but overall was a symbol of rebuilding, of a faction moving on from the post-apocalyptic setting that actually tried to create a working system and it just got deleted. It makes me think of the sequel trilogy. The New Republic was lasered in one movie. The achievement of the entire original trilogy and we didn't get to see it for more than five minutes. Sure, the NCR could be failing. I wouldn't mind that being depicted in other ways, but the way it was written just reeks of the same as the New Republic. A weak gut punch to bring in the status quo and the notion of which factions should be allowed to have a spot or not. At this point in canon, the entire US is basically just run by Brotherhood of Steel factions because there are none other left. Like it's the same fucking situation east to west. The west coast felt unique because it didn't have the Fallout 3 and 4 Brotherhood of Steel whom grew up into a regional power. It had other factions, other groups, and fuck, seriously, this just makes me mad as someone who likes world building. The Brotherhood of Steel has interesting culture too, but it's shown in every single fucking game. At this point, it's barely changing because Beth has gone with a mixed douchebag slash savior dynamic with the Brotherhood of Steel. What is even the difference between West Coast and East Coast Brotherhood of Steel at this point? Not to mention this exact thing happened in Dial of Destiny 2. Indy's son was just killed off and barely mentioned. I get this can happen, but the way it's presented is just jading from nowhere and it just feels shallow empty. And that is the end of the post. For those who don't know, part of why this is so frustrating for Fallout fans is that the show is canon to the games. This is not a different continuity. What they say goes for the show, goes for the whole IP's history. When showrunner Graham Wagner was asked about nuking Shady Sands, he said, quote, I think it would have been a mistake to go from the retro-futuristic America to another America that has been fully civilized and the NCR is doing everything great. We love Deadwood. I I think if there was a fourth season of Deadwood, there'd be insurance companies, there'd be traffic, and it wouldn't be a western anymore. We wanted to live in that first season of Deadwood space, of like, what's gonna happen? Where is everything? End quote. He also said, quote, it really was our belief also that though there are the events of the games, it's not frozen after that. History is not static. It keeps going and entropy is a constant, which is a less flashy way of saying war never changes. End quote. Wonderful. Let us not remain static in history by ensuring every last piece of progress is blown back to the Stone Age. One might assume they have a bias for particular eras and particular games, and if I were the showrunner responsible for this compost tornado, I would likely want no one to be aware of just how much that bias had bled into my work. I then uh, got very into 3, 4, and New Vegas. Um, I hope that doesn't make fans angry with me who prefer 1 and 2, but uh, Don't say your preferences. I, I think, considering his illuminating comments here, the show speaking for itself and his quotes elsewhere. Instead of having people be awesome, why not have them be dumb? It's become quite clear there may very well be a more zealous reason for what we have seen, but much of it can be explained by a set of creators that not only have no fucking clue what they're doing. You know, maybe if we were smarter, we'd be more daunted, but part of like maybe why we were selected is we were just guileless enough to uh, 
to wander into this. They only see value in a post-apocalyptic fallout wasteland if it looks the same forever. We can only see fledgling communities and partial settlements with roaming bandits, scary creatures, and ruined architecture. Anything progressing any further needs to be reset. Otherwise, the entire genre is apparently ruined. A spit to the spirit of the franchise, a completely embarrassing lack of nuance, and a total misunderstanding of said genre resulting in a broken disaster, acting as a tumor on a franchise desperate to progress but hampered by custodians who couldn't care less for its future as long as they get to bathe in their own radiation. Capitalism. All right, it. Bethesda want the post-apocalypse, and they will destroy anything that even looks like the post-post-apocalypse that gets in their way. Regardless, the story that binds this together, the very thing I am trying to assess, is fucking balls and deserves no respect. It is a fumbled fuck swamp of malformed idiocy that has no interest in respecting your time or investment but absolutely hopes you are distracted enough by everything else. We have a plethora of examples of insane plot armor, inconsistent and embarrassing mechanics, character assassinations, boring stretches of scenes with fuck all in them, broken world building, insufficient explanations essentially providing us the grand experience of knowing fuck all about the wasteland, the people there, what they think and feel about how everything functions or rather how it doesn't. The intrigue and reveal of Vault 33 wasn't merely the peak of wasted potential, it was one of the stupidest reveals in all of TV history. The dialogue, the atmosphere, the editing, it all needs work. The choice to have the first episode both inside and out of the vault was a stupid one. The reveal of Lucy entering the wasteland is absolutely undermined. The acting, while good for several of the participants in this circus, could use some work in that reactions to pain are highly inconsistent. There are many examples of weird or funny reactions when grievous injuries show up. Do you hear that? He kind of went, ah. Uh. Ah. However, sometimes you get more appropriate reactions, and then you get heavier reactions to things that aren't even injuries. And let's not forget this banger delivery from ADR Kyle McLaughlin in episode 8. It was everything the vaults had promised. She is lying. I'm a human! I'm a human male! She is lying. The gore often seems gratuitous instead of meaningful and entirely inconsistent. I am all for gore, but gore for the sake of gore is kinda boring and edgy, and this show has that in spades. There will at times be just awful CGI when they have no excuse, though despite feeling fake as fuck here and there, some sets were awesome and the costumes, including makeup, were top notch, which is almost more of a shame. Oh, and I'm not kidding, there is a full set of Zack Snyder Wonder Woman yodels for the it's so bad, and I'm gonna force you through all of it. And let's not forget how much they played Maximus's one flashback. I experienced it, so you have to too. To hurt the people who hurt me? Your entire life you've been looking for a home. Indiana Jones remains can be found inside a fridge. The characters need so much more work in general, so much of their journeys are damaged by basic interactions, jokes, attempts at being shocking, or of course, their actual developmental scenes being balked from beginning to end. As though the writer has many wonderful ideas, but has no idea how to make them coherent. This of course spreads to its themes. Everyone wants to save the world, they just 
they disagree on how. One being something of an exploration of many different minds' approaches to saving the world, you get the approach of nothing but trust and care, all the way over to getting what's yours no matter what, saving your own world, so to speak. I find this pretty meaningless in that nothing coherent is said or understood about how we will tend to contextualize saving our fellow man or the world we're all a part of. Most of it is random actions by characters the writers thought were much more meaningful in their journeys than anyone else did, with major points retaining the subtlety of pulling teeth. Look, Vault 31, 32, and 33 have to solve the dilemma of dealing with prisoners because they usually accept absolutely no one. Look, Moldava takes in all of everyone, and her only goal is to provide power to the people. Look, Hank just wants everyone who isn't him and his to die, making the world a peaceful place. Look, Cooper just wants his family, that's his world. Look, Lucy just wants to treat everyone as she would like to be treated. Look, Maximus just wants to be safe, comfy, and happy with Lucy. I guess their romance was so fucking pathetic. These explorations of approaches are all undermined by insane actions from the characters at every turn, and a half-baked execution damaging any sense of earning any payoff related to them. Vault 31, 32, 33, and especially Vault 4 should have been taken full advantage of by now, and their unadulterated presence in the Fallout world is almost an impossibility, alongside their attitudes being at complete odds with the world they've experienced. The leadership in all of them have absolutely no worldview that comes even close to anything other than embarrassingly distorted caricatures. Moldava is a foul witch who causes more harm to people than most, but the show completely missed that and thought she had a point of view that pushed for helping the many at the cost of the few, when we clearly see her hurt people that are not only not in her way, but that she is supposed to care deeply for. And then the less said about the three main characters, the better at this point. They push, even through the previously ons, that this show is all about the wasteland forcing people to adapt and change in order to survive. I'm sure they think this is coherent in that Lucy goes from happy-go-lucky to oh geez, a sharp mama, which was the unequivocally correct decision here when she is more suffering skeleton monster than person. In any case, any sense people have to make sacrifices or change their very nature in order to survive in this world is excessively undermined by every last decision in this cinematic steaming demon excrement being infested by retardation. The show may have said some things about trust and how the world is made so much worse by a cycle of the distrusting engendering more and more distrust. That was far from properly achieved in Lucy primarily, but almost all of the characters changed their approach to many situations despite being at odds with where their prior experiences would have influenced them. And don't even get me started on how much they fucked up War Never Changes as a theme, holy shit. The show had so much meaning to make use of and so much to say yet tripped over its many, many failings to simply slot itself into a garbled mess. A foul sewage katamari slathered in Fallout iconography. Tonally speaking, this is a train wreck. We have all kinds of incredibly serious deliveries with the writing crashing in like a drunken clown looking to beat its ideas into the scene whether compatible or not. The music will sometimes be awkwardly placed well before a realization, damaging the experience of learning more about a situation. Overseer Benjamin, this is Lucy and Titus. Hey guys! Just wanted to say hi. Why the fuck is the music so sinister? He's not evil, he's abnormal. Welcome to Vault 4. Just some housekeeping, a few things to be aware of. Having one eye isn't even that huge of a deal in Fallout. You'd be surprised as to the creatures you come across. Okay, that should cover it. <laughs> Any questions or- And this treatment in many of the scenes will make the twists and turns less surprising because the music is already rushing ahead. This, while also having stakes as big as death, betrayal, or small misunderstandings, all exchanging at seemingly random their own tonal accompaniment, leaving the average viewer to simply say, oh boy, things are happening. Which explains why people find episode 8 so disappointing outside of how bad many of the scenes are. You see, when you're being fed structurally incoherent imagery and performances, it's entertaining for as long as it keeps going. Once the ride stops and the questions are answered, you have to think about what you saw, and many people had no fucking clue what they thought outside of having fun. Which is wonderful, but not very meaningful and diminishes in retrospect. Now, let's talk about satire. I'm not entirely sure of what I have to say when it comes to that aspect of this show. They certainly want their serious, impactful cake while eating their sarcastic, satirical nonsense cake too. However, the problems obviously run 
run deeper than anything like that. It would appear the writers simply aren't familiar with the weight of their writing versus the weight of the presentation of said writing through the medium of a TV show. You are set to take this as a serious yet playful at times representation of human beings going through hardship, learning about themselves, and acting on values hardened by both pre- and post-World War. Yet they will say and do such stupid bullshit that's entirely antithetical to anything they could have an interest in that I end up wondering if we randomly trade out writers during lines, let alone scenes. For example, there is a scene in Vault 4 with the Overseer that essentially goes like this. I don't like foreign people, I hate their smelly food, their stupid ideas, and their annoying culture. I want to call them names, but they get offended, and so when I do call them names and make fun of their history, I have people upset because they don't get my jokes. But you have to tolerate them in order to be elected. I want to close off the borders, but I can't because of policy that existed before I came into power. Satire. Watching Lucy just stare disapprovingly at this boring stereotype slapped onto a random character that shouldn't even have these values whatsoever and bears no consequence on anything is as cringy as it is forced. But I'm sure someone found it funny. And of course, it's nowhere near as bad as... I'm not a communist, Mr. Howard, but all of the people everyone calls communists are right. <laughs> Fuck it hell. We used to have examinations of these topics that were not only bound to the tone of the story, but the specific subject matter at hand. It is genuinely incredibly fucking sad that we have countless examples of what are engaging, fun, thoughtful, extensive, dramatic, comedic, and downright fucking inspirational stories that relate to satirizing these topics. Whereas now, now we are willing to accept any slop that has the right label. What seems to have happened here is the shitty dramatic writing gets full protection from the nature of the satirical elements, even though those suck ass as well. This defense didn't work for Cinema Sins, nor did it work for Glass Onion, and it sure as shit ain't working here. If the Fallout show is any indication of the quality of satire we have to endure these days, then maybe Barbara had the right idea. The fact is, we're not making an unrealistic, absurdist comedy here. We're making a dramatic, satirical, post-apocalyptic adaptation of a video game story with comedic infusions, right? That takes skill. You can't just poop out your half-baked, edgy ideas on who the good and bad guys of life are because you have a Fallout skin. We have several examples of very serious and specific dramatic realizations that they want to have dramatic weight. When certain people die. When characters go through specific hardships. They often play the show very seriously. This is not a show in which we just forgive every last bullshit nonsense bit of writing because satire. Because oh, it's not supposed to be realistic. How about it fucking respects itself? Hot Fuzz is one of the greatest films of all time and it absolutely satirizes cop films along with the action genre as a whole. That's what I'm talking about. The goal was clear. The NCR, Volts, Nuka-Cola, Stimpax, Jet, Brotherhood of Steel, Dog Meat, Raiders, The Pip-Boy, Ghouls, Airship, Caps, Junk Jet, Rad Roaches, Vertibird, Cram, Mini Nuke, Power Armor, Grognak, Bobblehead, Shady Sands, NCR Ranger Combat Armor, New Vegas Skyline, Hacking Minigame, Water Chip, Protectron Robot, Death Claw. Remember this, remember this, remember this, and no story. The vast majority of the iconography isn't even Bethesda's, because they often fuck everything up. They couldn't even get the aim of a fucking crossbow right or de-age a person without making them look as blurry as the background of Army of the Dead. Get you, I fall in love. Playing basketball with bricks is fucking retarded, but it's the only piece of subtle, consistent writing because it would take an organization as brain dead as the Fallout TV show Brotherhood of Steel to not only come up with this, but to also find it fun. You can seriously end up in a spiral thinking about how retarded the show is. Like, they never gave a reason for Will Zig being the one with per personal access and use of cold fusion? They establish ghouls need one vial per day to stay sane? How are all of the ghouls in the world getting that? Why was there no visual check on Grimby for entering Vault 31? His entire plan falls apart if there's just one brain cell working on this whole operation. Look at this, guy shoots up and then flips in editing to shoot this guy. And uh, if you need any evidence of how war never changes went from a theme to a meme, just look at how long the pause lasts before she says it. More.
War never changes. I clapped! I clapped when I saw it! Oh, you see, the ghoul's accuracy is a reference to the VAT system. It's actually accurate to the games. He doesn't even have a pip boy, you stupid cunt. And no, no amount of Walto Goblins or Ella Purnell's Alita eyes are going to convince me this pile of shit is worthwhile TV. Demand better. Literally all the show had to do was make the retarded ghoul reference side quests and everyone's tripping over their soy encrusted pip boy bobbleheads to praise it. Oh boy, he typed in the text. 10th of October 97, that's when Fallout 1 came out. The game this show couldn't be further from. Just think for a second about how Lucy's philosophy is only tested in the sense that throughout the show people are mean to her and so will she continue to be nice to those mean people and people in general? The writers miss any remote sense of exploration of these ideas when there are countless examples of books, shows, movies and games that have already provided blueprints. If Lucy spares a man, even saves his life and that man goes on to kill another man's family, a family who are trying to help people, what is her responsibility in that interaction? Will she ever have to face a grieving father asking her why? Will she be challenged on the repercussions of the golden rule being applied to any one person who then has the very opposite effect of it on the next? If Fallout 1, 2 and New Vegas addressing philosophy is comparable to a pretty good restaurant, the Fallout show is absolutely the McDonald's of philosophy. But, like, all the workers are children, and they died years ago of shame. An absolute gushing waste of money blasted onto a project not worth a fucking cap. Also, it is outright cowardice that Amazon didn't want to mention China regarding the lore of fucking Fallout. But thank God they gave us the lore origins of the Pip-Boy thumbs up for fuck's sake. The Fallout IP as a whole is about the failure of pre-war ideas and the fallout of those failures. Economics, religion, politics, tribalism, philosophy, resource warfare, and, well, human nature. Greed, power hunger, dogmatism, arrogance, prejudice, callousness. The fallout of these ideas now have their descendants trying to rebuild in the very same world torn apart by an almost inevitable war. Combine that with its dark humor, thoughtful commentary, consequential decision making, and the quintessential retrofuturistic aesthetic, and what do you get? Well, you get a loyal fan base, one that looks forward to every installment, a fan base that is then greeted with this. The fallout out show is bad and you should feel bad that it's being praised to Helen back because when sludge like this gets recommended, it puts us in a position of having to appreciate adapted piss fumes from what could have been nothing short of great. Thank goodness they got the fucking references in there, the writing will come later. I am never gonna praise this pile of shit just because it has a Fallout skin. Amazon and Bethesda fucked this up big time and it ain't hard to see why. This is all of television now, you kind of, you make it almost to feed the conversation online. The Fallout Show has protein in urine and they know it. For those pointing out that all of the bad writing is here because it's adapting a video game, stop. Video game adaptations don't have to be shit. We have so many examples now. So many video game adaptations being treated with respect while nailing satirical elements. Do not eat this diarrhea just because there's corn in there. This shit was so bad they assassinated the character of a fucking dog. Capitalism is when explode earth. Communism is when person sane. Any tiny detail within the games that really appeals to you and is important to you, even if it's something small that you want to see on screen. Just the sort of 90s attitude towards capitalism. It's boring. You're boring, everybody. Quit boring everyone! Mark my words, this show's fate will align directly with that of The Mandalorian. Season 2 will be worse, and Season 3 will have everyone wondering how we got here. We got here from a shitty Season 1. Fallout got flanderized. <gasps> Dad, you killed the zombie Flanders! You was a zombie? The sheer thoughtfulness, breadth, and nature of this series has, over time, been whittled away until the surface-level iconography has become so oversimplified and removed of context that it now constitutes the entire experience. A sad fucking fate, but not one entirely dissimilar to many in our culture. This show is the direct result of taking the thinking man's Fallout games and ignoring their spirit entirely. No amount of slow-mo hyper-violence while playing 50s music or Johnny cash is gonna change my fucking mind, you worthlessly, creatively bankrupt vampire cunts. Fuck this terrible show, steer clear of it if you're looking for something new, watch The Gentleman, or Shogun, or Silo, or hell, watch Paint Dry, it'll be more productive.
Well, that was bracing, wasn't it? I mean, what were we expecting from the talent behind that Tomb Raider and Captain Marvel? Regardless, thank you for watching, and I am absolutely not joking when I say this video was only made possible by many incredibly talented people helping to put it together. Entire sections of visuals were created by Goga, Cat Hamper, Mark the Cyborg, Lazy Lenzy, Capital O Opinions, and Indigo Gaming. You guys are all absolute legends. Thank you so much for helping me get this project completed. I also want to give a thank you to the many people who reached out with Fallout lore. I got a hand from many users on Discord too, considering I am nowhere near an expert, but I think this video needed to get out there. This was an insane nightmare project for me, done in record time to have a place to point to when it comes to discussing this show and its flaws. And make no mistake, this abomination fucking melts the more you think about any damn moment, the more you watch any damn scene. Believe me, I know. It's a project no worse than the Halo show in many ways, however here, the music, the aesthetic, and the performances have shielded it to the degree that it is as critically acclaimed by some as fucking arcane. That's deranged. Fans of the Lord of the Rings outright rejected Rings of Power, and I fully recommend Fallout fans do the same with this trash. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please check out my other explorations of all kinds of movies on both my main and second channels. Over on EFAP, we recently covered Rebel Moon, The Halo Show, A Haunting in Venice, Themes in Storytelling, and The Three Musketeers. <laughs> yes, the, the, the Paul W.S. Addison one, yes. You never know what's gonna happen next over there. Now, if you want to support the channel, please check out the Patreon and subscribe star, and if you'd like a cuddly version of me haunting your every moment checking out media, then pick up the brand new Mola Cthulhu plushies, available now as part of the real BBC plushie set. You can buy Battle Damage Mola on his own, but if you buy him as part of the real BBC set, you get a 15% discount. Please go and check it out if you're interested, the link is in the description. Other than that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll I'll see you next time. I just caught some guy in here having sex with one of my chickens. Uh. Hypocrisy is like violence in your movies. If you only let the bad guys use it, the bad guys win. Oh no, the writers are fans of Movie Bob. <laughs>